All right, terrific. We are ready to go. We're running just a couple minutes ahead. So thank you all for being so prompt and on time. We have a terrific um, panel for you. Actually, both panels are, are fantastic. We have some of our, our favorite um, kind of Pony alum, friends of Pony, uh, hopefully some very familiar faces. But I actually hope to some of you some faces perhaps you have not always been talking to or always seen at every event that has to do with nuclear policy and arms control. At least that's our hope. Um, so uh, very grateful to Rachel Alhos and, the, and the, the team here. I'll let her do the introductions. But I will just say, by way of the next two panels, what we tried to do was take a look at the, the challenge of the future in arms control and unpack it in a couple of different directions. And I'm sure there's many more directions that we could go or could go in the future as we continue to work at the problem. But we've asked this panel to kind of give us a bit of a regional perspective. What's that global landscape out there? What are sort of the transatlantic relations? What are this, the mood in Europe? What's the relationship between what's happening in terms of arms control and the regional and global security environment and what we might expect in terms of non-proliferation and disarmament expectations? Um, how does this look in Asia? How do we think about North Korea? So how do we draw that lens from a global perspective to include issues with Russia, as Senator Fisher raised um, in kind of in such detail, but to kind of you know, look more broadly about where are the prospects in terms of places and countries? When we get to the second panel after a very short break, that's when we're gonna dig into a bit more of the nuts and bolts. How do we really think about what do we, want, what do we need as a country? What is the relationship between arms control and nuclear modernization and our force posture as we look to kind of create a synergy for strategic stability? Uh, I think in that sense, Senator Fisher's comments about trying to not see these as opposing forces, but forces that could be complementary is in fact um, part actually of the tradition of arms control. Um, so I think getting back to that idea will be very, very useful and trying to unpack some different ideas and approaches in those sort of mechanics or what we'll do in the second panel. So with that, I'm gonna hand things over to our moderator, Rachel Ellis, to introduce herself, the panelists, and we'll dig right into the issues and so get your questions and comments ready. All right, thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, my voice sounds worse than I feel, so uh, I'm just gonna power on, but, but I'm absolutely fine. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here with you all today. Uh, I am Rachel Elahus, I'm a senior fellow and deputy director of the Europe program. But as you can imagine, here at CSIS, there's a lot of um, cooperation among the regional and functional programs, and a lot of Rebecca's issues are foremost in the minds of our European allies and NATO. Um, just before this, I was watching the join us session to Congress where Secretary General Stoltenberg made a point about talking about the INF Treaty and exactly how allies intend to approach the follow-on in a united way, but acknowledging that there were still some differences and difficulties. But I think we have a great panel to set the scene for you here today. We're going to start with Rebecca Listner. She's an assistant professor in strategic and operational research department at the U.S. Naval War Co College. She's going to give us the broader trends and implications. Then we'll move to Oluek Kuhn, who's the deputy head of arms control and emerging technologies program at the Institute for Peace Research and Security in Hamburg. And he's also a non-resident scholar at the nuclear policy program at Carnegie Endowment here in D.C. So Ulrich will give us the European perspective and how allies are talking about this on the other side of the Atlantic. We'll then move to John Warden, who works in Strategy, Forces, and Resource Division at the Institute for Defense Analysis. He'll focus on the Asia perspective and in particular can give us some thoughts on what we're seeing out of North Korea in terms of arms control and development. And finally, we'll round out the panel with Rebecca Davis Gibbons. She's a postdoctoral candidate at the Belfer Center, and she's going to speak a little bit about the links between arms control and disarmament, and whether there's a symbiotic relationship there um, or a zero-sum game. So with that, I turn it over to you, Rebecca. Great. Thank you so much, Rachel, and thank you to Rebecca, Sarah, Bernadette, Annalise, the whole Pony team. I'm really delighted to be here today. Um, as Rachel said, I want to start by just placing this conversation in a broader strategic context, um, in particular to highlight several trends that I think will influence both the likelihood and the nature of arms control agreements over the coming decade. So to review those trends briefly, the first one, of course, is global power shifts. 
Over the next 10 to 15 years, I expect that we'll see changes in the global distribution of power that will beget great power competition. Um, given the climate here in DC, the discussions around the NDS, um, probably this will come as no surprise to any of you. Uh, but what this means in practice is that the United States is likely to remain the leading economic and military power, but its margin of advantage will diminish in Asia, while in Europe it faces continued competition with a stagnant and revanchist Russia, even as Moscow cannot upend the regional balance of power. Moreover, as many of us know in Asia, China's bid for regional hegemony is being fueled by its economic growth, but we also have a rising India with formidable military and, eco uh, military and economic heft, and a number of other growing Asian economies that might contribute to a more multipolar picture in that region. And finally, in Asia as well as in Europe, the United States continues to benefit from highly capable allies, but ones that will experience increasingly sluggish growth over the next decade. Um, and their lagging economies, as well as ongoing aversion to defense spending, will likely result in a dwindling share of global military and growth economic power vested in the West. Together, these three shifts suggest a world in which the United States remains preeminent, but is not globally hegemonic and is therefore more constrained, and in particular faces conventional military balances in a number of vital regions that are less favorable than they have been in recent years. The second broad trend that I think we ought to consider as we think about the future of arms control is technological change and diffusion. And here, perhaps most important, is the burgeoning field of artificial intelligence, or AI, which is an increasingly contested domain of international politics. It's widely expected to confer immense advantages, even as the ultimate nature and scope of AI's uh, national security applications remain unclear. But we do know that the innovation, diffusion, and differential adoption rates of artificial intelligence may well lead to arms racing. They may upend prevailing military dynamics. For example, by disrupting strategic stability in the nuclear do domain with the advent of autonomous nuclear systems or AI-enabled missile defenses, and they may also amplify cyber threats. This points up the centrality of technology to geopolitics and the fundamental role that is likely to be played by state-society relations over the next decade or so as both the US and our global allies and adversaries have to draw upon their domestic innova innovation bases in order to try to take the lead in this global technology race. And the third category will um, echo a bit the remarks that we heard just earlier, and they have to do with sociopolitics within the United States and particularly the climate in Congress. After Donald Trump's election in 2016, there was this wide view that perhaps the US was turning away from internationalism, but ultimately that hasn't been borne out by subsequent public opinion research. But what we have seen is an increasingly acute political polarization problem. And this actually, I think, is the more dominant and determinant long-term trend. It's likely to affect foreign policy in a number of ways, but I think the most consequential for us here today have to do with eroding consensus in Congress about the nature of the national interest, um, incentives for executive action as opposed to legislative or treaty-based foreign policy proposals, and particularly in the arms control sphere, and also the risk of undermining American credibility, both as a counterparty in negotiations, but also as an ally uh, to our friends and partners due to anticipated or actual policy volatility. So what do all of these trends mean for arms control as an element of American nuclear strategy, but also defense strategy and American grand strategy more broadly? I think most consequentially, the confluence of domestic dysfunction within the United States and power shifts internationally militate against formalized, legalized structures as the cornerstone of future international order broadly, but also arms control specifically. And we've seen just over the past 20 years that the United States has experienced a marked decrease in the number of new international agreements it concludes, with a particularly precipitous decline in Article II treaty ratifications. And this trend has more than one cause. Part of, it, part of it is a function of just the saturation of international agreements because of how many have already been concluded. But I think it also reflects enduring structural changes in the political environment associated <coughs> with that trend of partisan polarization. This dynamic, I think, makes treaty ratification much more difficult and, as I said, incentivizes diplomacy via executive agreements, which in turn are more likely to reflect specific presidential priorities and also lack the political insulation that can be afforded by congressional advice and consent. But regardless of how new commitments are created within the United States, all international agreements are exceedingly easy for presidents to exit. 
So whenever the White House changes hands, a polarized political climate suggests that presidents will be more apt to reject previously concluded agreements, resulting in a more volatile foreign policy and more volatile arms control environment. The Trump administration's exit from INF and JCPOA, the Bush administration's previous abrogation of the ABM Treaty are all vivid examples of this dynamic in the arms control space. And internationally, because of those geopolitical movements and technological changes I described before, cooperation faces additional challenges. Here too, we've already seen a drop of multilateral treaties since the year 2000. And I expect that as power continues to shift, as rising powers expect a more favorable future international environment, particularly China and Russia, they're likely to defer entrance into binding international agreements so that they can get more favorable arrangements in the future. This in turn, I think, leaves space for spoilers like Russia also to defect. It's also the case that a more competitive international environment will make it more difficult to insulate cooperation from rivalry, competition, and conflict. So taken as a whole, I think the future domestic and international environment that we are likely to face over the next 10 to 15 years may not be conducive to traditional models of arms control regimes. And let me just suggest sort of three provocations that we can uh, pick up again later. So first, I think that future arms control agreements will be complicated by the perceived need to account for China's growing nuclear and conventional capabilities. And they may well need to include China alongside Russia as a participant in future arms control agreements. Adding another player necessarily makes the variable geometry of negotiations more complex, but it also adds a new point of strategic friction given some competition that is inherent in the Russia-China relationship. Second, I think the contentious domestic politics of arms control within the United States may preclude the ratification of new treaties and possibly the extension of new ones, like New START renewal in 2021. And Washington and Moscow will then be faced with a choice between the wholesale collapse of the arms control regime or the need to identify creative measures to preserve strategic stability in the absence of formal treaties li limiting strategic systems. For example, perhaps by preserving verification and monitoring mechanisms to enhance transparency, even in the absence of binding caps. Third, any arms control regime for emerging technologies may entail a new set of hurdles. Rather than formally proscribing certain military technologies or placing legal limits on the quantity of weapon systems, arms control regimes for emerging technologies may need to rely more heavily on normative standards, informal agreements, to designate broad boundaries of acceptable behavior that can evolve in response to technological change. Thinking about AI and robotics, for example, dual-use commercial technologies make traditional modes of transparency and verification especially challenging, and they may require domestic laws and regulations to be effective. So this may, in turn, require shorter time horizons, more flexible agreements, and so on. So overall, I think this suggests a world of far greater uncertainty, and while we may wish it to be otherwise, a really challenging environment for arms control agreements as they have been traditionally understood. So I think it's therefore a world in which the United States may need to pursue more flexible regimes. That is, informal arms control regime, sorry, informal arms control regimes, regimes that disaggregate typical components of arms control agreements from each other, and or regimes with shorter time horizons. All the while, it will fall to the US, together with our allies, I think, to reinforce nuclear deterrence and create new, new deterrent thresholds where they don't presently exist. So with that sort of broad frame in mind, I'll turn it over to the rest of the panel. Well, thank you, Rebecca, for this, uh, as I think, excellent overview uh, from a broader and strategic view. Also, thanks to Rebecca Hersman and Sarah and the whole team here at CSIS Pony for inviting me to speak here today. Um, I will be focusing more on uh, the regional perspective, particularly on Europe, uh, where there are a lot of um, differences and difficulties that have been piled up with regards to arms control uh, agreements, not just during the last couple of months, but basically uh, the, uh, during the last 20 years. I want to structure my remarks along three main questions. The first question is, what are the main threats to Europe? Because when we talk about, as Rebecca said, arms control as an accompaniment to deterrence, we basically first need to identify what are the threats that we're talking about. The second question then is, what could be the value of arms control today uh, with regards to the European theater? And the third one then is, obviously, what's the impact of uh, Mr. Trump? 
So let me start with the threats. And it might not come as a huge surprise to you that we see a very scattered landscape uh, in Europe with regards to threat assessment. Um, I would uh, name five main threats that Europe is facing at the moment. The first one uh, are anti-liberal populist movements uh, like we see in Hungary uh, or Poland. The second one uh, is an aggressive Russia to the east. The third one is terrorism and migration uh, from the south. Um, that uh, includes the Middle East and Africa. The fourth one is a rising China that starts buying parts of Europe. Um, the latest deal uh, they just concluded was with Italy. And the fourth one, and I'm very unfortunate to say that here in Washington, uh, is the Trump administration. And uh, please mark my words, I'm not saying uh, America, but I'm saying the Trump administration. Um, so obviously these divergent threats are being perceived in divergent ways, which means that countries to the east and north prioritize Russia as the main threat, countries such as Norway, Sweden, the Baltic states and Poland. <coughs> countries to the west at the same time are less alarmist when it comes to Russia. Those are particularly countries like Germany, France, Belgium, the Netherlands. And then there are the countries to the south that obviously have other priorities, such as terrorism and migration. Now, these divergent threat perceptions obviously also translate then into divergent preferences. Uh, Poland and the Baltic states at the moment see little value in arms control, but instead want to boost deterrence. Um, we have seen uh, the enhanced forward presence of NATO in the four frontline states, the three Baltic states, and Poland. Poland has made it very clear that they think that is not enough. They want to build a Fort Trump for a full tank division from the United States. Other states, such as Germany, see little need for further enhancing deterrence, but instead they want to see a strong commitment to arms control. And here I disagree with the view of uh, the senator before, because uh, for Europeans, arms control is not just nuclear arms control also conventional arms control, because the conventional balance in Europe matters. Now, the ongoing INF crisis promises to deepen these differences. Poland and the Baltic states would perhaps welcome new deployments. Perhaps some of you have been at the Heritage Foundation last week when the Lithuanian defense minister spoke. And he made it very clear that he would like to see a reciprocal response to the Russian INF violation, uh, including missiles that might even be nuclear tipped. Uh, Germany and others want to avoid new land-based deployments, perhaps at all costs. And I think we should later also in this panel talk about what, what other options are at the disposal of NATO. So are we only talking about missiles or are there other options that might achieve a broader consensus within the alliance. Now, against that background, what could be the value of arms control in all that? And to be honest, I'm perhaps a bit too old fashioned here, but I don't think that we need to reinvent the wheel when it comes to arms control. Um, when we look at Europe, it's basically to make sure that Europe does not become the theater for INF missiles employment again. Uh, I'm sorry, employment. Uh, make sure we have, again, more transparency on Russian forces movement. Ideally, perhaps a regional conventional forces arrangement, uh, particularly where NATO is inferior, and that means, uh, well, first of all, in the Baltic subregion. Um, what's the impact of the Trump administration in all that? I would say it depends on where you stand. Uh, is it words or deeds that matter more? If you think it's words, then yes, we should all be pretty much concerned about the alliance. Um, if it's deeds, I would say we're actually in a pretty good state. Uh, the, uh, um, the European Deterrence Initiative uh, has been well funded, better funded by the Trump administration. In that regard, uh, I think Europe has not so much to complain. Um, but aside from the material dimension, I think that assurances also have a political dimension. Um, and when I say a political dimension, I basically mean that assurances 
should or must not only mean to send tanks if allies are concerned, because the concern might be of a political nature. And the Trump administration obviously sees zero value in arms control as an element of statecraft. And this is what makes allies such as Germany concerned um, with the Trump administration. It, concludes, uh, it includes the current uh, calls on INF. Um, we see that there seems to be no will to extend New START in that regard. Uh, also, the remarks by the senator were not very encouraging. Uh, and it also extends uh, to the JCPOA. Now, in reaction to the, to the election of Donald Trump, we have seen a very, seen a very surprising debate in Germany about uh, Germany perhaps acquiring nuclear weapons. Um, let me make this abundantly clear. Germany is not going to acquire nuclear weapons. Uh, that is a fringe debate. That fringe debate is almost over. Um, German policy makers do realize that for technical reasons it's not possible because Germany is also phasing out civil nuclear energy. Uh, the public writ large is opposed to all things nuclear, nuclear weapons and civil nuclear energy. And German policymakers also realize that uh, a German bomb would cause a massive security dilemma at the very heart of Europe. Um, but if I were you, I'd keep my eyes open uh, for uh, the option of a Franco-German deterrence cooperation in the years ahead. Obviously, this is caused by the uh, uncertainty that Trump is causing, but it might also be caused for technical reasons, because Germany needs to replace its aging fleet of the Tornado fighters and over the midterm also um, of the Eurofighter. It hasn't made a decision yes, yet, but it wants to have a sixth generation fighter jet with the French. Germans insisted that this fighter jet has to be nuclear capable. Uh, for, US, for, the, for this plane to carry a U.S. nuclear weapons, it would have to be certified by the U.S., which the French will say is a no-go. So if this plane doesn't get certified, if the Germans want it to be nuclear, then what nuclear weapons is that plane going to carry? So I would say it could perhaps in 20 years' time carry the French ISMP, nuclear standoff weapon. So let's keep our eyes open for additional deterrence arrangements in Europe which obviously would also complicate uh, efforts for arms control in Europe. And with that, I'll leave it and hand over to John. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, to Pony for having me, and it's such a great honor to, to be on this panel. So I'm gonna pivot a little bit and, and talk about uh, North Korea. And I think North Korea is an interesting example of some of the challenges of future arms control, but also an example of the way that arms control can fit within a broader approach to, to US strategy. So like Europe, the United States has important alliances in Northeast Asia uh, to South Korea, with South Korea and Japan. These alliances provide a number of benefits to the US. But associated with these alliances are, are US security guarantees. Uh, the security guarantees allow us to protect our allies from aggression, but in particular to protect them from nuclear aggression. So the United States and Northeast Asia has been remarkably successful with our alliances with both South Korea and Japan. Uh, since the Korean War, we've deterred major war from happening again. And we also have the additional benefit that comes with these alliances of per persuading our allies, Japan and South Korea, not to develop their own nuclear weapons. The complication is that North Korea now has its own nuclear weapons capability. It has weapons and the means to deliver them against the allies in, regional, in a regional setting and against the continental United States. And North Korea has also issued nuclear threats, both against the United States as well as against our allies, and has a history of carrying out kind of lower level conventional provocations. So faced with this emerging threat, you know, what, what can we do about it? What can the US do to preserve its alliance commitments while also kind of dealing with this change situation? And here is where I think arms control can contribute or be an element of a broader US strategy. The US strategy would be designed to deter uh, North Korean aggression while managing confrontation in a productive way and hopefully reducing tension. So after the fire and fury of 2017 led to summit diplomacy, it seems like the Trump administration has settled on a strategy where essentially it's trying to raise economic pressure on North Korea in the hopes that at some point North Korea will say that the pressure is too much and they therefore want to decide to give up their nuclear weapons in exchange for kind of sanctions relief and other economic investment. 
The theory is that we haven't got there yet, but the pressure is increasing because of recent sanctions, and that North Korea, that might cause North Korea to change their perception. The problem is, if, if this administration is wrong, and there's no amount of pressure that will give North, get, persuade North Korea to get rid of their nuclear weapons, then there's a lot of risk that comes with that strategy. And I, I uh, would associate myself with that assessment. I'm pessimistic that there's any amount of pressure that is going to convince North Korea to give up their nuclear weapons. But if we continue to push down that path, there are some risks that we're taking in, in doing it. One is that in the time that we wait for pressure to get high enough for North Korea to give up their nuclear weapons, North Korea has the ability to develop more. They can increase the quantity and the quality of their nuclear weapons program and their means of delivery. Second is that if, in fact, we do increase pressure and North Korea is pushed into a box or feels increased pressure but is still unwilling to give up their nuclear weapons, then there's worry that they may take desperate actions. We've seen in the past what kind of in 2017, the, the tension and the provocation that's possible. And I think finally, and another aspect of this, is that there's some risk that if the United States is seen as the one insisting on North Korea giving up their nuclear weapons for too long and we're not on the same page with the rest of the international community as well as our allies with South Korea, then the U.S. could be perceived as the one who is holding up any progress towards peace or reduced tension on the Korean Peninsula. And that could cause problems both in terms of our ability to sustain an international coalition for sanctions, but it also may cause problems with us with the U.S.-South Korean alliance. So therefore, I think because of those risks, the United States should at least consider an alternate path. And that alternate path is kind of more traditional arms control. So presumably, or another option is that the United States might, instead of saying that North Korea has to give up nuclear weapons before we'll entertain certain sanctions relief, to instead say that we are trying to quantitatively and qualitatively limit North Korea's nuclear weapons program while maintaining a goal, a long-term goal, of working towards North Korean disarmament or denuclearization. So the U.S. through this arms control with North Korea would attempt to advance four goals, and they're very consistent with the general goals of arms control that Rebecca talked about in the opening remarks. First is that we would try to make it so that we're more likely to deter North Korea from using nuclear weapons. Second, we'd want to increase the likelihood that we could deter North Korea from carrying out non-nuclear aggression against our allies in the region. Third, we'd try to reduce the consequences if deterrence fails and for some reason that there's a conflict between the U.S. and North Korea within the region. And finally, we try to limit North Korea's ability and willingness to transfer nuclear weapons related capabilities and know-how to third parties. Hopefully, we would be able to achieve all of those goals within an arms control agreement that we might pursue with North Korea. To achieve the first three goals, the United States could attempt to cap and constrain North Korea's nuclear forces. So by limiting the nuclear threat that is posed by North Korea, the U.S. would also make it less likely that North Korea would use its nuclear forces as a cover for conventional aggression. So it would contribute to that combination of those first three goals. To achieve the four fourth goal, the U.S. could restrict the supply that North Korea has of fissile material to make it so that they are less likely to transfer on nuclear material. And they could also make an explicit condition of any arms control agreement that North Korea not participate in nuclear weapons related proliferation activities, an explicit quid pro quo that would come from any agreement. So there are a number of ways and we can imagine arms control with North Korea might work. There are a number of mechanisms that we might use to restrain North Korea's nuclear program and therefore a num also on the other side a number of concessions that, that we might be willing to offer. So the ways you can think about the mechanisms is you might limit North Korea's nuclear weapons production and fissile material supply, you might limit the number of nuclear armed delivery systems, or you might limit the development and production of nuclear capable missiles and launchers, or ideally you'd be able to have some element of all three. And in exchange, the United States and its allies might consider offering things such as security assurances, limitations on US and allied military posture and activities, and sanctions relief and economic investment. So as is obvious from these parameters, and, and they're very general, and I'd be happy to get into more specifics as we discuss in the questions, negotiating arms control agreement with North Korea is going to be different than a lot of the arms control agreements that we've looked at in the past, and it's also going to be a lot more complicated. And there are a few ways you can think about some of those complications. The first is that the US and its allies are going to have to make asymmetric trades. We're going to have to think about how certain changes to things like an exercise program or military posture or economic investment that's going to provide some benefit to North Korea's economy, how much restriction on North Korea's nuclear force is that worth? 
What is the trade-off in which it would be, still be a net benefit for U.S. interests and U.S. and allied interests? And that's going to be hard trade-offs and require hard calculations about what, what our interests are and what are the different mechanisms that might actually advance those. Second, another complication is that we're going to have to coordinate with two different allies. Japan and South Korea are both U.S. allies, and they, but they have different threat perceptions, both of each other and of the U.S. And the, the fact that there are those different threat perceptions is going to make it difficult to manage any arms control process that we might have. And just as an example, the U.S. obviously is very concerned with ICBMs that are a direct threat to the continent of the United States. But if we pursued an agreement that was an arms control agreement that only limited ICBMs but allowed North Korea a full range of regional strike options, that might be worrisome in particular to Japan, but probably to Japan and South Korea. It's an example of the type of tension that we're going to have to work through as we, as we potentially look at this path. And finally, I think another complication, and this is, this is a, a characteristic of all arms control, but it's maybe even harder with the case of North Korea, we have to look at verification and compliance measures. There's a long history of failed negotiations with North Korea. There's a lot of mistrust that exists between both sides. So what is a verification and compliance regime that is actually going to work for both sides? Is the IEA going to get involved? Uh, is it going to be something that's going to be a lot, rely a lot more on national technical means instead of on-site inspections? What can we do, and, and what are the, the ways that we can think about those problems? Again, these are just kind of the parameters of the types of issues that we need to work through. So these are hard challenges, and I think the, the challenges identified show that even if we were to make a decision to pursue an arms control agreement with North Korea or to try to pursue an arms control agreement with North Korea, it's possible that it would never work. There might not be a trade that will actually fit both sides' interests. But there would still be some benefit in pursuing this. And this is part of the overall argument about why arms control needs to be a benefit of the US strategy. At best, if we put forward this arms control proposal, maybe we'll be able to find ways to incrementally take steps that would both reduce tension in the region, reduce the nuclear threat, strengthen US alliances, and advance our interests in the region. It's possible, and maybe we can take small steps that would move around that, around that path to see if it would work. But at worst, if those steps don't work, but the United States has put forward this vision for uh, what is a reasonable and effective vision for arms control within Northeast Asia that would contribute to security, and North Korea is seen as the unreasonable party who's unwilling to meet halfway, that would reveal something about the intent behind North Korea's nuclear weapons program, and it will also strengthen the U.S. position, both in making sure that we're on the same page with our allies and that we, it is North Korea, not us, that is contributing to a deterioration of the security environment, and also in the international community, where if we need to marshal a response that is focused on either greater sanctions or something like an international containment of North Korea, we will be in a better position to be able to lead that coalition. And I'll stop there. Um, I want to thank uh, Pony for having me here today. Thank you uh, to Sarah and Rebecca. I've been um, a beneficiary of many of the Pony programs over the years, and I'm very grateful uh, for those experiences. So my remarks are going to focus on how current trends, whether that's low-yield weapons, new nuclear capabilities, the loss of strategic arms control, and the increased salience of nuclear weapons may affect the future of nonproliferation and disarmament. And I'm going to be talking about three effects. The first is the deepening divide between nuclear and non-nuclear weapon states within the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, the NPT. So as we know, non-nuclear weapon states tend to see strategic arms control as evidence that the nuclear weapon states are abiding by their Article 6 commitment in the NPT to pursue negotiations towards disarmament. Deep frustration with the pace of nuclear reductions to date and many perceived broken promises by the nuclear weapon states has already led to the creation of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, very commonly referred to as the Nuclear Ban Treaty. And so the loss of arms control, the increased salience and value placed on nuclear weapons is only going to add to the non-nuclear weapon states' frustration, particularly with the U.S. and Russia, over the lack of disarmament progress. And then I want to point out that you have to also think about the context of the 2020 Review Conference, when all the members of the MPT uh, come together every five years. 2020 is the 50th anniversary of the treaty, but it's also the 25th anniversary of the extension of the treaty. So the US, back in the early 90s, engaged with its allies in a hard-fought campaign to extend that treaty in perpetuity. There were many non-nuclear weapon states at the time that wanted shorter increments, whether it was five years, 15 years, 25 years, because they recognized that those were points of leverage that they had over the nuclear weapon states to engage in some kind of disarmament. 
Uh, they lost that leverage when the treaty was extended indefinitely. And you can imagine that many of those non-nuclear weapon states today feel some regret over what happened in 95, especially looking at the current context. So the deep, this deepening divide over disarmament is going to hamper the ability of the US to address future non-proliferation challenges. So just to give you two examples, after nuclear weapons were discovered in Iraq, uh, after the Gulf War in 1991, the US really was behind the effort to get the model additional protocol, right? That's the more stringent safeguards agreement that most states in the international community have adopted. That effort required years of negotiation, the US working with other states, including allies, to convince them uh, that this was valuable. And it's very hard to imagine something like that happening today in the current context. I would say it's almost impossible. And then more recently, many people I've spoken with attribute the ability of the Obama administration to rally the international community and put economic pressure on Iran uh, with bringing Iran to the, to the table. And I think it's also hard to imagine that today in this context that the US would be able to, to rally the international community mm -hmm. in that same way to address some future uh, proliferation challenge. So most significantly, it's difficult to imagine how the non-proliferation regime will be able to continue uh, in perpetuity if the majority of the participants think that the five nuclear weapons possessors uh, are not complying with Article 6 of the treaty. We've always had disarmament challenges with the MPT, but I think the fact that we now have this treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons means that this is only going to be more difficult and this is kind of a permanent feature of the MPT architecture going forward. So that's the first effect. The second effect is undermining the norm of non-use. Some people like to call this the nuclear taboo. I do not like to call it the nuclear taboo, so I'm referring to it as the norm of non-use. Uh, a number of activities and actions we see around the world today serve to undermine this norm, but not just undermine this norm of non-use, but to just show the importance with which the nuclear weapon states uh, hold nuclear weapons. So we see this in cavalier talk about nuclear weapons. That includes uh, President Trump's tweets. You mentioned um, John, the, the fire and the fury, also bragging about the size of his nuclear button. Uh, we see this in Putin's threats that he's made, even in Stratcom tweets. So I don't know if, if, if you saw the tweet on New Year's where um, Stratcom showed a video of, of a B2 and talked about the ball dropping uh, in New York City, in Times Square, and saying, you know, if we had to, we could drop something very, uh, more powerful. Within three hours, they took that tweet down. But I've actually seen other tweets uh, it, over the course of the fall last year that, that were somewhat similar to that. So I think, I think there's a growing um, comfort with talking about nuclear use that's problematic. Uh, just a, a quick uh, plug for one of my uh, colleagues at Project on Managing the Atom that's relevant here. Read Polly's piece that came out in International Security last year looks at declassified war games from the Cold War and tries to adjudicate the different proposed causes of the nuclear taboo, right? So is it about precedent? Is it about deterrence? Is it about morals? And one kind of new idea he comes up with after studying all these war games from the Cold War is that non-use is in part based on the signals that commanders participating in those war games received from their leadership, right? So think about the signals that commanders might be getting today. There's other things, expanding doctrine of, doctrine of nuclear use, which we saw in the recent nuclear posture review, uh, new nuclear weapons, new launch vehicles, talk of a Euro deterrent, right? That's something that uh, we might not, or that we wouldn't have seen before. And so I'd say all of these trends send the message that we've entered this new era when nuclear weapons have renewed importance and renewed value. And I think we have to think about who else is looking at those messages. So are there leaders in states, are there, um, specific factions which in, state, in states that don't currently have nuclear weapons that are looking at all these valuable things that these nuclear weapons can do and saying we should have them too. So I think it's, it's a problem from a proliferation uh, perspective and a non-use perspective. All right, so the final effect is that these trends are gonna bolster the campaign behind the nuclear prohibition treaty, the nuclear ban treaty. And so I would argue that if the public starts to fear nuclear war again, if they see arms racing, the loss of strategic arms control, it's likely that the nuclear ban movement will become more popular. So far, I would say we haven't seen the, the ban movement attract widespread attention, and I think that is because there's little public knowledge still about nuclear weapons, and there's a lack of fear about nuclear weapons and arms racing. 
uh, but that could change. So if we look at past examples of when there's been popular movements against nuclear weapons, it all stemmed from fear. So in the 50s and 60s, when parents realized that there were nuclear isotopes in their kids' baby teeth, you know, we had people protesting in the streets, and we got um, the, I always forget the name of it, the, we got the Limited Test Ban Treaty and the Threshold Test Ban Treaty, right? Two treaties related to limiting testing. It was also fear of a nuclear buildup that brought people to the streets in the early 80s, right? Worried about uh, what Reagan was going to do, and we get a million people in Central Park in 1982. I think it's possible that, again, if people are worried about losing these constraints, if they see an arms race happening, then we could return to a place like that again. Um, so in conclusion, I guess I would just say that the broader nuclear nonproliferation regime has been a, strate a strategic benefit to the United States, and I think we've long taken it for granted. There have been pundits and observers uh, since the MPT was first adopted that have been saying that the sky is falling, right? We're at the nuclear tipping point, we're have a, we have a cascade, we're at the precipice. We've, we've seen those analogies. But, uh, at um, the risk of being wrong and being one of those people, I think this time we really are at a dangerous place in terms of nuclear nonproliferation. Thank you. Everybody was really on point and kept on time. And we now have about 30 minutes for discussion, and then we'll open it up for questions and answers. Um, <clears throat> so picking up on what you all said, one of the things that came out that was not necessarily reassuring, but it was a common theme in all of these, is that everything is becoming less predictable. We have a military balance that's less favorable, whether it's in Asia or Europe. We have allies who are becoming less capable and less willing to help us across the board. And we have a growing gap between the United States and those allies we traditionally rely on. So a question probably to all of you is, how do we take active steps now to prevent that gap from growing even further? Because I think without those active steps, the U.S. will be left holding more of the burden in writing, you know, in looking after arms control. And at the same time, several of you have indicated concerns about the U.S. willingness to do that. Um, and then my second question, where I think we can really have a good discussion, is on creative measures. We talked about taking things outside of the traditional mechanisms of international law or multinational negotiations and having verification and compliance regimes <coughs> excuse me, outside of these formal structures. I think this is not um, an unrealistic idea. If I look at the example of the UN law on the sea, for example, the US hasn't been a member of that, hasn't ratified that for years, but yet we live by all the provisions of UN clause. So you could almost foresee um, regardless of the Trump administration, and I often sit in conversations where the blame is put on them, but I think this aversion to having your hands tied by international agreements and constraints is something that will persist. Um, if you just look at the national security strategy, it deliberately does not say international rule-based order. So I think we have to prepare ourselves for a world post-Trump where there is still this disdain for formalized international constraining agreements. So I'd like to explore a little bit, first of all, how do we stop that gap from growing? And then second of all, how do we think through some of these creative measures that still is achieve the same goals of verification, compliance, restraint, but outside of formal mechanisms? Mm -hmm. Rebecca, do you want to start? Do you want me to start? OK, sure. Um, so perhaps I'll sort of take both together in a way because um, I think that insofar as we pursue creative measures, they will be far more effective if they're done in concert with allies and partners. And the process that leads to the creation of that, those measures can in turn, I think, start to close the strategic gap and the threat assessment gaps that might exist between the United States and our allies and partners in Asia, Europe, um, Middle East, and elsewhere. So, I think that we need to start considering the ways in which 
um, state practice as opposed to formally agreed international law can try to um, create new forms of international governance where they don't exist now. And that certainly uh, means in terms of new areas of nuclear arms control, but I think it also means other types of emerging um, arms control or emerging technology arms control, even conventional arms control. Um, and I think there's sort of two ways that we can think about it. And one is how do we create positive norms in ungoverned or undergoverned spaces, places where such norms don't exist now. Um, and that may have to do with the advent of new types of nuclear systems, but that might also have to do with other areas of technological innovation. Um, and there, I think that the mandate will be to basically create what starts off as smaller coalitions of states that agree on certain norms and certain modes of state practice and to basically use those as a jumping off point at minimum to prevent countervailing norms from coalescing at the behest of states that don't share our interests. And maybe at best to form the kernel of what could evolve to be much more fully realized regimes um, of many different types, but to include arms control regimes. Um, the second place where I think state practice can be very important, even in the absence of formal agreements and in international law, is in setting new deterrent thresholds. And this is a question of the United States and where possible with our allies, both through um, sort of implicit signaling, but also through explicit declaratory policy and basically laying down sort of what are those new deterrent thresholds? Where do they lie? Um, what are the penalties for crossing them? So I think those are two ways in sort of a much more bottom up and much more emergent fashion than we've been used to uh, that the United States can lead, um, taking advantage of its still very formidable um, allies and partners and sort of other friends around the world to try to minimize some of the unpredictability, which is to say enhance some predictability and try to sort of shape the emerging security environment in a way that is maximally to our advantage, even if formalized international agreements prove exceedingly difficult to achieve. Makes a lot of sense. Well, Rick, we already have some of these arrangements in Europe through the Quad and the Quint. Are there ways that we could build on what Rebecca is saying in terms of increasing predictability and transparency from the bottom up. Um, and for you, I would just add, I was very concerned about the, the logic you walked through with the Eurofighter eventually flying Rafale, because that actually would undermine Article 5, NATO's collective defense commitment, insofar as France's nuclear capabilities are not part of that NATO structure. So we are essentially creating yet another decoupling and more uncertainty. Um, so if you could build on what Rebecca said and then, then specifically address that concern. Well, the question is how do we achieve more predictability uh, within the alliance? And again, I think a lot of uh, unpredictability <coughs> stems at the moment from the White House, but also from allies such as Germany uh, in, in Europe. Um, in, in principle, I would say that the, uh, the paradigm of America first runs contrary uh, to uh, governing alliances. Uh, because if you're only uh, interested in, 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 in your interests, then you're not going to get far with an alliance. Um, so I'd say that one of the things to make governing the alliance in Europe more predictable is to rediscover diplo diplomacy. Um, and to give you an example, there is uh, a lot of talk, and I think correctly talk, about why Germany is not living up to its 2% uh, spending commitment that Merkel then gave in commitment that's going to be 1.5. Now it looks it's not going to be 1.5. Um, why not be more clever from the US side and act diplomatic and work through the French? It is much more easier for a German chancellor to explain to the public that is heavily opposed to Mr. Trump that the French president would like to see the Germans spend more, for instance, for strategic autonomy. And as long as America is not yet gone from Europe, strategic autonomy and future capabilities combined with NATO and the US, I think, would be a good thing. So that's one of the instances where I would say a bit more clever diplomacy, or in general diplomacy, uh, could help us achieve something. 
a little bit about the creative measures, what you said at the, at the beginning, uh, because you asked what could that be creative measures in the realm of arms control. Again, I'm skeptical here. So these days there is talk, for instance, about asymmetric arms control when it comes to the China-US uh, relationship. Um, but asymmetric arms control, come on, we had that in the INF Treaty. So the Soviets got rid of many more missiles uh, than, than NATO did. Um, others say perhaps there's a way if we go unilaterally. We also had that. Gorbachev, Gorbachev withdrew uh, half a million soldiers in 1988 in exchange for nothing first. Um, then there is talk, well, we should perhaps do something less legalistic because Congress, the Senate, they're not able you know, to agree on any treaties anymore. Well, just look at the PNIs. Uh, that was also just simply, you know, reciprocal measures where one side says, okay, we do this, the other side says, okay, we reciprocate, but it was not, not a treaty. Um, others say, what about if we combine arms control and security? So meaning that the U.S. offers arms control in exchange for good behavior, for instance, in the South China Sea, or with regards to Russia not undermining the Baltic states. Well, we had that experience with regards to the CFE Treaty, where the United States tied uh, clear security measures in the post-Soviet space to an arms control agreement, which led to the implosion of that arms control agreement. So last point about um, France and Germany. First of all, I would be not very worried at the moment. I would be worried that it is a sign that allies feel that they're not being taken serious by the United States and that the United States might further pivot away from Europe. Um, if there ever is some kind of Euro deterrent or a cooperation between Germany and France on these issues, first of all, if then still the NPT exists, Germany would have to make sure that it uh, is still in compliance with the NPT. And second of all, who tells us that such an arrangement couldn't be in one way or another arranged within NATO or tied to NATO. I mean, the French were out of the political mechanisms they were in back again. So in that regard, alliances can change. I wouldn't be too worried in that regard. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll take both the questions in a slightly different way. So in terms of staving off, I, I think it's obvious that one of the main advantages that the United States has is the alliances that it has with like-minded countries in the world. So preserving those alliances is a core goal, but because of all the trends that, that Rebecca talked about, um, there, are, there is, uh, allies are also going to have to take on a greater role for themselves. They're going to have to take on a greater role of the defense burden. They're going to have to be more leaders on the international stage. So it's finding that balance that is, is going to be the challenge going forward. And I think arms control is an example of something that fits within it. The U.S., it, it, if the goal is to maintain a strong alliance system and to maintain strong extended deterrence and deterrence. And getting allies to support the overall US and, and allied approach, getting everyone on the same page is an important part of that. And arms controls, it can be an important way of making it so that everyone is on the same page, whether it's in Northeast Asia or in Europe. Um, the second question about kind of what are creative, what, are there more creative ways that we can look at arms control? You know, when I talked about North Korea, I think North Korea is going to require creative ways to look at arms control. The, because you can't do a, we're never going to do a, a, a reciprocal agreement where the U.S. gets rid of all ICBMs and North Korea gets rid of all ICBMs. We have other commitments. It's just not a realistic thing. So it's going to require a lot of these difficult trade-offs that are, that are sometimes hard to imagine. So in thinking through what that is, it's, it requires creativity. Um, and I think the other thing that it's going to require is, is kind of a look at whether, whether and when incrementalism is, is in, US, in U.S. interests. Are there more narrow trades that can shape the North Korean nuclear program in a way that would be advantageous for us in exchange that we can provide reversible, limited economic concessions? For example, if we start by looking at waivers for particular economic investment projects in exchange for limited reductions and then start to expand out and maybe to repeal certain sectoral sanctions in exchange for other more significant concessions. And then when the big rever irreversible economic sanctions relief starts to come, there's a lot more coming on their side. You know, is it possible to make an agreement work in that way. And again, I, I don't know if there is, but I think those are the type of creative things that we should be exploring. Right. I guess first I would just say that the way we've talked about arms control this morning has been um, mostly about 
uh, treaty reductions, bilateral strategic arms control, but that we need to think of arms control more broadly in terms of transparency measures, confidence building measures, strategic dialogues, all of these other things uh, that do serve arms control. Uh, the second thing I'd say is I think with emerging technologies, Right now, it's unclear who's going to sort of win out in a number of contests, whether that's hypersonic, AI, cyber. And any individual country is going to hope that it's going to win out. And so it's going to have fewer incentives to engage in any limitations until, it, until this sort of shakes out and these countries figure out kind of where, where they land there. I think once we get there, once we realize kind of who the winners of these contests are, then countries will have more incentives to engage in maybe more traditional arms control. And then the final thing I would say is that um, the U.S., uh, the State Department in December announced a new um, approach towards disarmament, creating an environment uh, for nuclear disarmament. Uh, I am on the record of being cynical about uh, the establishment of that program. However, um, and the goal behind it is to, the U.S. is saying that we can't do traditional arms control, we can't do the ban treaty, and so the way to move forward is to try to create the environment or create conditions for nuclear disarmament. Um, and recently, China said that that, pr that approach, this creating the environment approach, would be the way that it would abide by its Article 6 MPT commitment. So I think now I'm slightly, op maybe very slightly optimistic that this P5, uh, that the P5 might engage in this um, creating conditions program and that, that might lead to discussions that will eventually lead um, to more traditional arms control. It sounds like, uh, although there are some commonalities between the problem set in Europe and Asia, it actually is a bit of a different approach because whereas Europeans are leaning forward and very hungry for more arms control, more focus on non-proliferation, more disarmament in varying degrees, in Asia you almost have to incentivize people to come to the table and play. And John, you spoke a little bit about this dynamic between Russia and China and how some of the friction between them can be used to get not quite a grand bargain, but to incentivize them to come to the table. So my question is, despite the differences in approach in the two theaters, is there a way to have almost a big tent approach where we bring in our European allies and NATO, we bring on board China and South Korea, and we create this collective pressure on China and Russia um, to get what, what we want and bring people to the table? Do you see any prospects for that? Um, I, I would say it's an admirable goal, and I, I think there are kind of elements in certain pol policies where you can see the kind of connection between the two regions. And I think the example of the fact that the, the U.S. is talking a lot more in Europe about kind of the importance of the rise of China and kind of what that means for Western security more broadly is an example, I think, of the need for kind of the Atlantic and the Pacific to be connected in terms of the way we think strategically and the way that our alliances are connected. But I think as you've pointed out, there are a lot of divergent interests and just coordinating among US allies in Europe <coughs> is very difficult and just coordinating among US allies in Asia is very difficult and therefore coordinating among all US allies is going to be even more challenging. Yeah. Could I jump in on the Russia-China thing? Um, so I think this is a really interesting question, less because I expect that that kind of very broadly multilateral um, arms control conversation would yield much in terms of actual outcomes and success. But there is this sort of coalescing narrative, I think, particularly here in Washington about kind of Russia-China axis of authoritarians and this idea that Beijing and Moscow are drawing ever closer together. Um, certainly, there are myriad examples of near-term cooperation uh, that we've seen over the past several years that are likely to continue. But I think it behooves American strategists to also look at the points of friction between those two countries and to think about ways that we might actually seek to amplify them um, so as to prevent the two from actually cementing any kind of uh, more formalized cooperation or access or whatever it might be. And to me, multilateral arms control is one of the best ways to do that, right? Because we all know that part of the reason that the Russians don't want to engage in real limitations on their non-strategic nuclear weapons is because they want them for China, right? Um, even if many people in Moscow don't want to say that out loud. So I think by trying to bring in both Russia and China, perhaps in a much broader context, um, to talk about these issues will actually begin to expose a lot of the latent friction in that relationship. And in that sense, could be a productive wedge, wedge strategy for the US to consider. 
I think that's, that's a great point and something worth exploring. I'd also argue that I wouldn't completely cut off the idea that asymmetric tools could be used to incentivize the Russians. We just went through an exercise here at CSIS where we worked with kind of a, a track two, track three dialogue with Russian colleagues to think about what kind of changes they'd like to see in the security environment writ large. And I don't know if these are trades that, that NATO and Europe and the United States would be willing to make, but for example, they were very concerned about potential violations or perceived violations of the NATO-Russia Founding Act with um, the potential additional deployments to Poland. They're very concerned about what kind of posture could end up in Montenegro and North Ma Macedonia as the alliance continues to enlarge. So as we think about how we bring all these different actors on board, I think I wouldn't, just, I wouldn't shut off the idea that asymm asymmetric measures could work with regard to the Russians. Um, I want to turn us over to, to Q&A, but I did have one more question for Rebecca, because you made a very interesting point about how the lack of progress on arms control um, is increasing calls for disarmament and stalling progress on non-proliferation efforts. Does this resonate at all within the Congress? So I wasn't here for the Senator's intervention, but if you had to sort of characterize or categorize Congress according to what they support in terms of arms control, disarmament, non-proliferation, is there a gradation there where we could explain to them these connections and say, hey, I know you're not particularly interested in arms control, but I bet you're even less interested in proliferation and disarmament. So is there, is there something there that we could, we could try I, to do? I think approach? it's a really important point that, the, <coughs> that those two things have not been tied together. Um, with New START, you did see um, Secretary Clinton and other people in the administration uh, making that connection, that this is, this is not why we're doing it, we're doing arms control for strategic reasons, but there is a connection between that and our NPT non-proliferation, um, or NPT ar uh, Article 6 requirements. Um, I think probably, I mean, I'm, think, I'm looking at Amy Wolf over there, I'd, I think educating Congress is a, probably a very difficult task, and particularly educating Congress about these issues. Uh, we've lost, you know, not with the turnover, we don't have the people that were, um, kind of the go-to senators on these issues of proliferation, non-proliferation, and arms control. Um, and I think you make a good point. I'm not exer sure exactly how we go about that, but I do think we need to draw the line because, uh, and what we see in Congress just reflects this taking for grantedness that I've talked about and that I'm concerned with. Well, are there any final points from the panel before we open it up more broadly? Okay, so the floor is open. I think there's someone in the back with a mic that we can utilize. Don't be shy. I have more questions. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm actually, um, I'm interested if perhaps you all could comment a bit on this sort of, uh, I think uh, Rebecca Listener kind of, what I might call sort of a tapestry approach. You know, is there a way to kind of, and in, in some ways I think it, John, it fits with your description of even approaching North Korea or others in Asia in terms of maybe there are small bits and pieces to be gained um, in terms of posture, in terms of uh, sub-agreements, in terms of informal arrangements, and I'm wondering if we could um, pursue that uh, a bit more. I believe, Ulrich, I believe you've written about this as well in terms of are there actually kind of posture type agreements, positioning, uh, places of employment. We've talked about that in a European context. Um, in the North Korea context, I think it's been talked about in terms of could you look at the disposition of conventional forces in some ways, such as, you know, kind of the placement of artillery or backing off from the line of demarcation. So just what might some of the tapestry items that would ultimately make a, a quilt, you know, you could knit together, um, that they may not be formal, traditional, broad scope, ratified, treaty-based arms control, but perhaps might go about some of the business of controlling. Um, so over to all of you on that. I'll start. Um, so I, I think 
I don't know exactly what a tapestry approach is, but I, I definitely think that there are uh, examples of, of small agreements that we should, we should pursue and that would be in our interest. So I think the, the, the main thing is connecting it to what is your theory about how you're going to improve the security environment. And, and you talked at the beginning about the different ways that arms control could contribute to that. So in the North Korea example, there, there are, I think, definitely conventional arms control agreements that would reduce the chance of miscalculation, that would make it so that if there was a conflict, it is less likely to escalate. Things like positioning of forces. I mean, the Conventional Forces in Europe Treaty offers examples about the types of conventional agreements you might look at in terms of both numbers, but also locations of deployments that might be in the mutual interest of both sides. And I think that extends to the, the nuclear realm as well. And that's an example, though, of you can pursue some conventional arms control, you can pursue some nuclear arms control. Hopefully, you'll be able to find both, but I don't necessarily think that they have to be done as part of one big overarching agreement, that instead, if there is narrow trades that can be made that are in mutual interest, then they, they should be pursued. And you know, hopefully, also, you know, they, they should only be pursued in the benefit that they provide as that standalone agreement, but then there's also probably something to be said for the fact that you've, you've reached an agreement and hopefully opening up the possibility for more. Hmm. Um, perhaps, le let me just point out a few of those, um, I would say, islands of arms control that we still have. Um, so there's uh, the Open Skies Treaty that's still working and it has overcome a crisis, more or less, uh, that was uh, experiencing it during the last couple of years. I think what we need more in the years to come is more mill-to-mill -mill dialogues um, that could be between NATO and Russia, but also, of course, between uh, the US and China and uh, other adversaries to NATO and the United States. Uh, particularly dialogues, I think. Uh, you don't have to legalize them, uh, but on a regular basis, that's important. Um, if a uh, new start breaks down and sounded pretty much <laughs> like this in the opening speech. Uh, I would say make sure that we keep at least the notifications in one way or another so that we know when which side is doing what. Um, with regards to uh, European security but also uh, East Asian security um, uh, for the naval passage, uh, what about uh, the INCSI and DMA agreements for risk reduction measures? Uh, what about those countries that have not these risk reduction measures, perhaps on a bilateral basis, in place? Uh, in Europe, uh, a lot of countries around the Baltic Sea don't have these agreements in place. Uh, is there perhaps there a chance for a, a little multilateral regime? Um, then there's the structured dialogue in the OSCE. Perhaps uh, that's not very well known, but it's, it's an effort by all uh, OSCE states to basically uh, identify little steps that could be done in arms control. So I think those are the ones uh, at the moment. Um, well, the whole atmosphere is so bad that probably we shouldn't even talk about too much about these efforts and just see that they're, go that they're still ongoing. And well, yeah, that's what I see. And if it offers any reassurance, there are two things that actually have not changed. So in the nuclear posture review, the U.S. declaration of use did not change to mm -hmm. my knowledge. So despite some of the tweets and the rhetoric and things, it's, you know, continuation of policy from the Obama administration. And then today, NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg said, um, I'm not sure if it was with the approval of the Lithuanians or not, um, but he said there will be no new U.S. land-based nukes in Europe. Nukes. Yes. That's important. So conventional is... is so conventional is still part of um, the options, and I think that this is a huge mistake to continue these kind of statements and lines, and we can talk about that later, yeah. why I think that's And land base mistake. is also, in my view, potential code, because Poland has um, expressed interest in, in some sea-based capabilities. Mm -hmm. Just to pick up on sort of one other point about the kind of islands uh, upon which we might be able to build, um, you know, Rebecca made some really great points earlier about the kind of bottom-up pressures on the non-proliferation regime, but I think it also bears sort of noting the inverse of that, which is that the nuclear weapon states continue to be fairly united in their desire to not see additional nuclear weapon states um, come 
uh, into the world. And so, you know, knowing as we do the history of the Non-Proliferation Treaty and how it, of course, came out of uh, cooperation despite Cold War era competition between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, um, I think we can see uh, the possibility for sort of major power or nuclear weapon state uh, cooperation in furtherance of uh, the non-proliferation regime, even as it does come under increasing pressure for all the reasons that Rebecca described. Yes. Hi, I was wondering, um, to what extent do you think uh, artificial intelligence will affect the, the conventional nuclear balance, and do you see there to be any implications for our arms control regime structure that we have today? I can start, um, you know, by no means would I claim deep AI expertise, um, but my sense is that there's just a lot that we still don't know about what AI is actually going to mean, particularly in this space. Um, and at most, it seems that it's likely to be more of an enabling platform than, or an enabling capability rather than an independent platform. Um, on the sort of destabilizing side of the ledger, um, you know, there are certainly concerns about the way in which AI might enable certain types of autonomous systems, which could themselves um, potentially <coughs> undermine, um, you know, deterrence and strategic stability. Um, there's also concerns about the way in which AI might be able to supercharge missile defenses in destabilizing ways, um, and also people talk about, you know, the way in which big data could potentially make things like, you know subs much more um, easy to track than they used to be. So all of those are potentially destabilizing. And I think it's not just the sort of capabilities um, that are important to think about, but it's also the rate of diffusion. Because you could think about you know, an innovation being made of this kind, and for the interim period in which only one state, let's say, and it's not necessarily going to be um, you know, the US or China that has these breakthroughs first. It could be a middle power, um, or even a smaller power, potentially. Um, for the time that those um, states have these capabilities to themselves, I think it creates certain destabilizing incentives as well to use them before they spread further to other states, potentially. Um, so I think that's where, um, where you could see um, some potential destabilization. And then there's also the sort of cyber AI nexus. Um, again, sort of getting a little bit outside of my own lane here, but even so, um, you know, the way in which um, you know, AI can make cyber capabilities um, more uh, capable, in, a, in essence, but also the ways in which um, the increasing integration of AI into existing military systems can make them more vulnerable to cyber attack. And I think, you know, seeing as we have um, an escalatory ladder that isn't quite as vertical and well-ordered as it used to be, I think the more um, instability we see in cyberspace and also at the seams of these different domains, um, the more the entire uh, structure and uh, structure of deterrence is likely to be um, sort of called into question to include in the nuclear domain. I can add to that. Yeah, I, I would just add that obviously cyber and AI are very difficult realms in terms of arms control verification. And so that's why I think it's very important to have strong norms and that the U.S. Uh, should be a leader in sort of uh, norms. And I think so far the U.S. has done that um, with, I believe it's still in the books, but the directive that came out um, maybe in 2014, about the idea that, as, uh, at least for now, a human would remain in the kill chain. And I think that's very important for obvious reasons. Um, but I would also add that the same group that is behind the nuclear ban movement also is part of the ban killer robots campaign. And that seems to be moving forward, and that it's important that the U.S. continue to engage um, in those discussions and not kind of let a treaty happen without being present, as may have happened before. Um, you made the comment earlier um, about your concern about um, the growing comfort of talking about nuclear weapons as problematic. Is your concern with the, the references you cited more on the flippant nature of which they were made, or is your concern based in other areas? And then specifically for the whole panel in general, I'm interested in your thoughts on, on what, are your, what are your thoughts on the most effective ways of, of kind of re-educating either the American public or re-sparking or re-energizing a global debate around nuclear weapons that is not fear-based? 
Sure, I'll start. So I think I am concerned with the flippant nature. I think that on some level shows a lack of understanding about what nuclear weapons can actually do, and that reflects, and that's based on the public not understanding um, and, and just moving far enough away from the Cold War where we don't have this fear of nuclear weapons. I also think some of the comments reflect a potential broadening of use, so moving away from that these are primarily, primarily weapons for deterrence. Um, and, and just the, the, the last point that I had made is that it makes them seem more valuable and perhaps that's not what we want to be doing is making other non-nuclear weapon states think like, oh, they can do all these great things, we should have them too. Um, so I'll just kind of piggyback on that a little bit. So I think one of the difficulties that the, that the US faces is that there's kind of sometimes tension between maybe the, the way we would like to shape norms around nuclear weapons use, but also what's required in order to deter adversaries. So in order to effectively deter, our adversaries have to know that the United States would be willing to use nuclear weapons and has the capability to do so. And um, I think the most recent nuclear posture review assessed that we needed to reinforce that message to particular adversaries to make sure that they got the message loud and clear, uh, both in the way that they've kind of rolled it out and described it, but also in some of the pursuits of capabilities that they've described. But I think that is somewhat in, in tension with kind of some of the normative aspects that we might want in terms of shaping it so that other countries don't don't think that nuclear weapons are just another instrument of war. We want to shape international uh, international perceptions of nuclear weapons such that they remain on the background, in the background, as opposed to becoming at the forefront of the way that other countries think about them. And I think there is some tension in that. So um, finding the best way to describe both the, the, the fact that the US would use nuclear weapons and would be willing to use nuclear weapons when its vital national interests are, are at stake in extreme circumstances and would not hesitate to do so in order to advance its interests, but at the same time is, also, is very much thinks about nuclear weapons in a serious way, understands the gravity of their use, and therefore really does want to persuade other countries not to cross that threshold, is I think uh, you know, there is some tension, perhaps, but I think it, it's, it's a, a line that the U.S. can walk effectively in conveying both of those messages at the same time. Mm. About the question, how do we re-energize knowledge or raise awareness, awareness without having it, based, having it be fear-based? Um, I don't know why it should not be fear-based, because it is a serious issue. Um, so first of all, I think that uh, I would wish to see uh, Donald Trump and Mr. Putin publicly agree on something that I think we all would agree on, that a nuclear war uh, must not be fought and cannot be won. So that is one of the first issues. Um, the second issue that I would say to um, uh, advocacy groups like ICANN and others, I would say go to Hollywood, talk to, talk to the big stu uh, studio bosses and uh, make another movie. I remember that uh, Ronald Reagan was very much impressed with a movie the day after. Where, where is the day after today? We're, we're hearing every day that we're moving closer to the brink, but it seems that that hasn't reached the public and I think that would be a powerful instrument and if that movie would be fear-based, yeah, so what? Well, um, I think, frankly, uh, since the 2016 campaign and particularly through um, the most fearsome parts of 2017 and the height of the North Korea crisis, I mean, we've sort of seen what this looks like, right? I think that, um, you know, speaking very anecdotally, I can say that, you know, things that I wrote and tweeted about nuclear weapons gained so much more traction in a world sort of post Donald Trump's campaign and election than they had previously. I think that line of attack against him um, during the 2016 campaign was a very effective one because there was this real concern about him being the person um, with his finger on the nuclear button, so to speak. Um, and, you know, further anecdotally, I certainly have, you know, many friends who are, you know, way off in California who never think about national security, who were planning their exit routes from San Francisco if there was a North Korean ICBM headed their way, right? So, uh, again, all anecdotal, but I think it shows the way in which um, both the Trump presidency and the acute nature of the North Korea crisis under his leadership have kind of pre penetrated 
uh, the national psyche in a way that hadn't existed previously. Um, I'm not sure, I, or in fact, I do not believe that that is a good thing, um, but I think it's also very difficult to replicate under non-fear-based conditions, precisely because you know people generally don't uh, pay a lot of attention to foreign policy at all, um, let alone nuclear weapons. So. I think there's only going to be heightened public consciousness when these issues are highly salient, and they're going to be highly salient usually when um, we're living in dangerous times. So um, there are certainly many avenues we could think of by which we could end up in scenarios where that salience remains quite high. Um, that would be unfortunate, but maybe inevitable. But I think that's really the route to greater public engagement. I'll ask another question because it's one that I get all the time, uh, which is what do you say to those who, who, who argue that there's no point in pursuing arms control um, or disarmament in an environment in which those you'd be negotiating with are not going to comply or the verification mechanisms cannot be trusted? Is there a rebuttal to that or ways we can increase that to, to bring people on board who may be skeptical? And I think arms control agreements have to be negotiated uh, based on the interests of both parties and that they will uh, stick as, as long as that remains true. The INF no longer, uh, the Russians no longer seen, uh, saw it to be in their interests. I mean, I think that treaty also teaches us the, the problem of having a sunset clause on, on verification. Mm. Um, that's, that we probably won't make that mistake again. Um, yeah, I think, I think it's important to go back to the Congress question. Um, I think it's important that people realize that arms control is not a gift that we give other countries, that it's something that's in our strategic interests and it's in their strategic interests as well. And as long as we have verification, and you know, there's a lot of discussion during the Cold War about militaries, militarily significant cheating, and that's an assessment that you do, but if you can get to a place where you realize that um, you would be aware of the cheating and enough time to do something about it, then I think we can have a, more confidence in at least pursuing uh, traditional arms control. Connect this back to the last question a little bit. So, I mean, I think in general, uh, as the U.S. kind of looks at its policy both in Europe and, and in Asia, there's on the nuclear issue in particular, there's kind of this balance between risk of, there's the risk of weakening <coughs> deterrence such that you have more risk of an adversary maybe intentionally um, you know, starting conventional aggression or, or using nuclear weapons, and then there's also risk on the other hand, of inadvertent either use of nuclear weapons or inadvertent escalation. And a lot of US policy is about kind of balancing between those risks. And in the best case, we can pursue policies like an arms control agreement, for example, that would do nothing to weaken deterrence but would reduce risk, right? And in that case, it's, it's a no-brainer and we should pursue it. The more difficult question is when sometimes those things are in tension and we have to trade, provide, you know, taking on a little more risk over here in order to reduce risk over there. And that's kind of the difficult space where a lot of these policies live. And I think that is kind of the additional, the, the challenge that the U.S. faces in both of these regions. Um, and so, you know, it, to your original question, I, I mean, I think that we should in, use that kind of mechanism to evaluate individual arms control agreements. And yes, there is kind of, it's connected to disarmament, and that's one of the reasons that we should sell as a benefit ar of arms control. But it would be even better if we could sell the kind of benefits of arms control as a ri risk reduction measure completely separate from disarmament. And if we're realistic about what it's trying to achieve and realistic about kind of its objectives narrowly, then the verification is also a more realistic problem to solve as opposed to something that, that is you know, impossible or that people can use to poke holes in it. Um, so just two things on this, and I broadly agree with everything that's been said. I won't repeat it. Um, but one has to do with just a basic recognition that um, you know, when we do engage in arms control, that doesn't mean that it's going to transform the relationship that we have with our counterparties. And I think that there's a lot of discomfort, particularly in the Russian case, 
um, of sort of trying to understand, well, should we be evaluating each of these agreements on their own terms, sort of strictly in terms of their compliance, or should there be spillover between like interdependencies between these agreements? Does cheating on INF mean that cheating on New Start is inevitable? And then even more broadly, you know, can arms control agreements be insulated from you know broader atmospherics in any of these relationships? Um, and I tend to think that each one should be evaluated on its own terms, precisely according to the frameworks that John and Rebecca just articulated. Um, but second, just to sort of flip the question on its head, I think we also have to realize that there are countries around the world who are asking this question, but about us. Why would we engage in arms control agreements with the United States when Iran was perfectly in compliance with the JCPOA and yet the US still walked, right? And so, um, you know, getting back to some of those uh, trends and those sort of domestic polarization issues that I talked about before and the sort of anticipation of continually wild swings in our own politics, I think it's really, we need to look in the mirror and thinking about this question too and whether we can be a reliable counterparty and trying to understand why other countries would want to engage in arms control control with us, um, you know, knowing that the U.S. may itself effectively cheat or at least withdraw. That's a good point, but in that space, I would, I would say particularly, I, I know the European audience better than the Asian audience, but in the case of both JCPOA and INF, there was, okay, in the case of one a violation and the other, just general unhappiness with, with how much it constrained Iranian behavior. So there was a moment there where Europeans could have done something about it, right? They could have worked with the Iranians to um, shore up JCPOA. They could have compelled, try to go to Moscow and compel the Russians back into compliance. Now, whether and why that did or didn't happen, um, and whether it would have made a difference in this administration, I think we need to think about how um, our allies can have a bigger voice to shape that space about, okay, we have our verifications, we have our boundaries, we have our limits, but then when they're violated, it can't just be on the United States to, to put the foot down and, and, and call it to task. I think that alliance, um, let's do it together perspective, is on the front as well as the back end. I think I saw a question in the back. Thank you. Hi, well, thanks very much to the panel for your thoughtful comments. I, um, there's been kind of like whiffs of, of this topic ro woven in and around what we're talking about now. And so I just want to <coughs> ask the question point blank and, 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 and hear your opinion. And, and that is, um, I'm repeatedly struck by the extent to which Americans, at least, really misunderstand what arms control is, how it works, and what it's good for. And I feel like the debate around the JCPOA really teased this out of the public. Um, it you know, was heavily criticized for basically not solving an abundance of security problems. Ulrich, you talked about the need for like a Hollywood movie a la The Day After. Rebecca, you mentioned kind of like when people aren't scared or activated about this issue, it doesn't have as much political weight behind it. So my question is, why do you think Americans, at least, misunderstand arms control to the extent that they do. Could it um, be a function of how it's branded, essentially, as we rely increasingly on export control regimes like Vassenar? I mean, there's nothing less sexy than the Vassenar arrangement, <laughs> right, to control our dual-use dual capabilities. Do you think arms control needs a rebranding? Does it need a, a better marketing? And Ulrich, in Germany, where the, 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 the sentiment is so much more positive about arms control, is that equally steeped in, <coughs> in reality, non-reality? Is, is there as, uh, I guess, salient a misunderstanding about what arms control is, how it works, and what it's good for? Perhaps. I try to address the latter. Uh, thanks, Amy. Um, well, I think Germany is a good example of a country that um, perhaps attaches too much importance to arms control, whereas overlooking other areas uh, of security. Um, I'm not going to get into 90 minutes uh, historical, psychological lecture why that is the case with Germans. But the broader point is that some Europeans see arms control as this nice 
instrument, a feel-good instrument that feels warm, where people get together around a, a table, they, they develop you know, a, a common ob objective, and in the process they get closer to each other. And uh, I think that this sometimes, uh, on the meta level, this kind of understanding shows through on the European side. Whereas the United States, as uh, well as all great powers that uh, first look interests, capabilities, uh, they are much more determined and say, okay, what, what do we get out of that? The, the larger problem that I see is that on the US side, increasingly it seems that no one or a very small minority seems to think that something would come out of arms control. I'm, I'm not questioning us and most people here in the room. But it seems that um, not, just, not just during the Trump administration, but also during the Bush administration, and in parts during the Obama administration, it seems that Amer America has lost its, its more broader and general interest in arms control. So perhaps there needs to be a re redefinition on, uh, on the US side as to how does arms control actually support and fosters the interests of the United States and perhaps its allies. And I think some of the points that Rebecca made and, and, and John made uh, are very helpful in that regard. Perhaps we need a little bit of a change of narrative here on this side. Uh, uh, I don't think that Americans don't understand what arms control is, but I think they need to be reminded of that there are, there are net benefits there, like serious net benefits. OK, um, so I think this is a really interesting question because um, at least in large part, it speaks to the sort of just paradox of the American political psyche and strategic culture, which is that we are an immensely powerful state, like powerful sort of beyond almost any historical precedent, and yet we are so difficult to reassure, right? The standard for security, like for Americans to feel truly secure is immeasurably high, right? And so there's this sense that, yes, okay, we got the JCPOA, and that had meaningful you know, limitations on Iran's near-term ability to acquire nuclear weapons, but that's not enough because they're also doing other things. Or this morning we heard that even if the Russians are complying with the law of New START, they're not complying with the spirit because there are all these other capabilities that they're now developing right outside of what was covered by the agreement. So I think we just have this tendency to always sort of look beyond any given arms control agreement, which will necessarily be limited to other perceived threats and to focus on those. Um, and it's, it's a national pathology that I think we ought to move past, right, because we're never going to be as powerful as we were in the media post-Cold War era, and we need to start getting comfortable with um, actually much more significant threats that we're going to have to be facing persistently in the future, but it's very difficult. Um, second, I'd say that you know, the arms control community, especially as it sort of bleeds more into the advocacy space, does itself view favors, in my view, by just portraying arms control as an end in and of itself. Um, just because I think that there's also this kind of political culture of sort of, you know, fairness and the idea that sort of everyone's out for themselves. And I think just the idea of cooperation for cooperation's sake, to your question before, doesn't resonate um, quite as well as sort of harder, more interest-based arguments. Um, but third, I would say there are elements that the U.S. does understand. I mean, we could think about like the use of the sanctions instrument in, in support of arms control agreements like what John was talking about before. And I think that is something that the American public quite likes that plays to our enduring advantages in terms of American financial primacy um, and will likely remain an important part of this mix. Um, but finally, I would just conclude by saying that ultimately I don't think we need to win over the public on arms control. I just, you know, to my, to the last question about sales, I mean, I just don't think this is a salient enough issue that we really need to bring the public with us, at least as a general matter, but maybe as a specific matter when, you know, future administrations, for example, are trying to sell particular agreements, whether it be with North Korea, whether it be with Iran, whether it be with Russia. I mean, those need to be um, very clearly rooted in these sort of interest-based arguments. I think that will be very important, but kind of making a generic case for arms control, I think, um, will fall on, on deaf ears, frankly, and isn't, isn't worth um, a significant expenditure of our time. Um, just on the question of the public, I mean, I, I take your point, but I do think it's problematic when we have this trillion, trillion plus, whatever the new number of the day is, modernization program, and there's absolutely no public discussion about that in a democracy. So I take your point that we, on arms control, maybe we don't need to bring the public with us, but I do think it's a problem that, that, that the public doesn't know about um, 
nuclear weapons and arms control. And Amy, I loved your question, and I think that we should all think about this. How can we rebrand arms control? Um, the START Treaty, you know, it's like the original <coughs> START Treaty, I and mean, it's a lot of arms control is really boring. It's in the details, right? Um, and I think this is also a problem of conflation of disarmament with arms control, right? So you can have many different arms control instruments that don't reduce any weapons, right? But it's yeah. about reducing the risk of war, reducing the effects of war, reducing the costs of arms racing. Um, and one thing that your question made me think is that domestically, whenever we've signed on or whenever the Senate has given its advice and consent to arms control agreements, there's always some contingent in the government that gets bought off. So with New START, you know, the uh, we, I think it was 100 million, right, that Senator Kyle wanted. And that's true of all arms control agreements. So the message that that's, I mean, the implicit message there is that those people that had to be bought off, whether it was the Navy or the Air Force or someone in D else in DOD, says that not everyone is on the same page about valuing arms control if they needed to be bribed into supporting it. So I think that's a problem we have, uh, and that's where it comes from looking like this gift instead of something that's in our strategic interest. Can I just jump in? One more. So I very much agree with what was said. So I think there are kind of like two aspects of what would be required, and I'll use North Korea as an example, but I think it's more broad. I think one is that we have to be more kind of, kind of specific about what the benefits of the agreement are. So with North Korea, for example, I mean, we, I think that there's a benefit in keeping North Korea at some limited nuclear capability as opposed to a much more expansive nuclear capability because much more expansive, I think, means that there's more risk that they might initiate conventional aggression, there's greater risk of nuclear use if there's an actual conflict, and there's also greater risk of proliferation. And that's a kind of an interest-based argument. So therefore, we should have an interest in using arms control to try to restrict and limit the amount of nuclear capability that they have. We can have a debate about the best way to do that. We can have a debate about what concessions are worth getting there. But there's kind of a, a core interest-based argument that is, is why we should pursue arms control. But the second other aspect is that we have to be realistic. You know, arms control is not probably going to transform the relationship with North Korea. It's you do arms control with countries that you don't like. In an ideal world, North Korea would have no <laughs> nuclear weapons. It would be a thriving democracy united with South Korea. But there's a limits to what we can do realistically with American power, and therefore we have to accept sometimes compromises that we don't love. And you have to, so I think making both of those arguments about the, the narrow interest based argument about why an agreement would, would advance kind of US interests, either narrowly or broadly, and second, that is it perfect? No. And acknowledging the imperfection, but also acknowledging that imperfect agreements are still agreements that could be in the interest of the United States. Thank you for a really interesting panel. Um, I'm going to ask one of those questions about arms control that's boring and a little technical, and we'll put everyone to sleep. So this is not uniformly the case, but it was largely the case during the Cold War that one of the main aims of arms control was to reduce first strike, nuclear first strike instability, and arms race instability, and, and to some extent provide transparency and, and some predictability. Any future arms control involving either Russia or China is going to depend on some kind of management of the conventional forces issue. And my question is, is reducing nuclear first strike stability no longer the right standard? And the reason is, you could imagine that constraints on conventional forces or even missile defenses in a place maybe like the Asia Pacific would actually raise nuclear first strike instability for maybe the US in ways that we might not want to think about or that might create difficult sort of conceptual doctrinal challenges. And so is there, is, there a, is there a standard that stands out, obviously? Is it just reducing all first strike instability, conventional or not? Is it an escalation ladder issue? Obviously, we're not going to solve this problem today. But should we be thinking about what is our new sort of working principle or working aim? And, and presumably, we're going to have to tailor that to, to different adversaries in different contexts. But, but I'm wondering if we're not facing a sort of bigger a conceptual challenge here that we might fully anticipate, other than just looking for ways to reduce those things that we tried to reduce during the Cold War. Thank you. I'll take that one. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I very much agree that kind of, so with the traditional kind of definition of first strike instability, it was a worry that the other side might fear, <coughs> Russia might fear that the US, or the Soviet Union might fear that the US would go first. They would think that there is some advantage to them going first as a result of, of, of that fear. And that they were, there was also an element that they think that's, that escalation to the, the highest level is inevitable. Right? So a lot of those aspects of first strike instability that we were, were worried about in the Cold War, I think, are much less relevant today. 
You know, first is that I think in general the postures of both sides are a lot more survivable, and therefore the possible advantage that you would have is going first is reduced. And I also think that you know because of the different stakes that we imagine for conflicts today, the likelihood that either side would say that escalation to the highest level is inevitable is is much lower. So kind of the in general, first strike instability is less of a worry. So I think that what that means is that in order to think about what the objectives of arms control, we have to think about probably different definitions of, of crisis instability that are, are more broad. And so I think you're exactly right that that requires, I think, some conceptual work in terms of understanding what are the sources of crisis instability that are likely to arise, and then thinking about arms control agreements that can get after those sources of crisis instability rather than arms control agreements that are more traditionally aimed at kind of the, the Cold War era first strike instability issues, which is you know, survival forces and make it so the forces are less vulnerable to first strike, reduce first strike advantage, et cetera. So I think you're, you're exactly right. Uh, let, me, let me just add to that, uh, Brian. When we, um, when we look at, at NATO's eastern flank, um, we might see a scenario, depending on whether you believe uh, in uh, the, the escalate to de-escalate doctrine or not, but let's assume for a second that this could be something that the Russians might be doing, even though perhaps they might not even have the doctrine, but that doesn't matter. But the first employment of nuclear weapons uh, in an offensive scenario basically can only happen in in conjunction with a conventional advance. So, and that points to two areas. It points to um, uh, conventional deterrence and defense. And when we talk about arms control, it then points uh, to the Russian side, basically transparency mechanisms and perhaps regional ceilings. Uh, obviously, we are super far away from that. But I'm just pointing out that those are one of the areas where, uh, where the nexus between conventional and nuclear plays a huge role, and where, would, where we would need uh, a modern and up-to-date uh, conventional, uh, well, you know, sub-regional agreement. We're not talking about these huge European <laughs> agreements we saw during the Cold War. But, uh, but in that regard, uh, if we want to prevent uh, the first employment of nuclear weapons, that could be a, a way via arms control in a world where the Russians do agree that they would have an interest in that. Obviously, that's not the case at the moment. Why don't we take both questions, because we're getting short on time. Thank you very much. Uh, Kingston Reef with the Arms Control Association. I'd be interested in the perspectives of the panelists on the future of arms control and strategic stability in Europe and Asia, so long as the development and fielding of missile defenses remains unconstrained and open-ended. And if any of the uh, panelists think that future looks bleak, um, what a control regime, or short of that, a confidence building and transparency regime for missile defense might look like? Thank you. Second question. There was another question at the same table. Yes, Edward F. Stanford University. I heard here today, and I've heard in other meetings, that if we had only kept the INF verification regime in place, the Russians could not have cheated. That, that's just not true. The INF on-site inspection regime went on for 13 years, which was 10 years after all of the systems had been eliminated. If we had kept the on-site inspection regime in place till now, it would not have been relevant to the Russian violation. That violation was detected through national technical means which is always available regardless of what treaty regime there might be. Since I said that, I'll start. I, I certainly don't think that would have stopped the Russians, but I think it is a point that we shouldn't have sunset classes on verification regimes. And there's also just added value in us sending inspectors to Russia, inspectors coming here, the transparency, the intelligence collection. I think, I think that's valuable. I, 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 I take your point. I still think it's <coughs> valuable to, to continue that. Yeah, and can I just quickly jump on that, because, uh, uh, Ed, you're right, um, but I think the larger takeaway here is when we look at the current debate, because some of the, the arms control proposals that are now being floated, for instance, a no first deployment pledge by NATO in exchange for the Russians moving the missile beyond the Ural Mountains, 
Um, in Germany, that debate uh, is being discussed in the, par in, in the parliament, and a lot of people say, yeah, but you know, there is no verification mechanism. And I would refer to what you just said, national technical means. Because the national technical means uh, were enough to detect the Ru Russian violation, so they should also be sufficient uh, to make sure that the Russians uh, stick, stick to that. Because, look, we are not getting a, a super tight uh, uh, treaty signed agreements with the Russians in a post INF world. We have to take the little things that are av available. And in that regard, yes, I think uh, national technical means could be important. So uh, I'll take the missile defense question. So I think it, it's, it probably depends on what type of stability that, that you're talking about. I think that oh, undoubtedly the U.S. pursuit of missile defense will cause arms race instability in that if our defenses are perceived as more capable, then particularly North Korea, China, and Russia are going to start thinking that they may have to have more capability required to meet whatever their deterrence requirements are. So I think that one, we should kind of acknowledge that reality and know that that incentive is going to be there and, and therefore acknowledge that that's likely what the reaction is going to be. Um, and then second, I think that the related aspect of that is to, to make sure that we're actually getting a, a net benefit out of that. Is If it's not cost effective at the margin, if their ability to build up more missiles is more capable than, than our defenses, then, then we should assess whether or not our pursuit is actually worth it. So um, I, I'm less worried about missile defense causing crisis <coughs> instability, but I think I am absolutely, I think you're absolutely right that the incentives are there for arms build up. And, and, if, therefore, we don't think that it's in our interest to have what is essentially an offense-defense arms race because the adversary is going to be able to build up countermeasures that are cheaper than, than our defenses, then, then we should look at whether, whether that's unilateral restraint in terms of what we deploy or whether or not that's norms, whether or not that's arms control. All of those things should be on the table in terms of things that, that might advance U.S. interests. But it, just to sort of add a brief coda to those I think really uh, insightful comments is I think this is really somewhere where we come up against our own domestic political barriers because as elegant as everything Don just described is and sort of intuitively and uh, rationally compelling, I think there is just an ideological component to the way that this debate unfolds in the U.S. Congress and it's really hard to see um, how that conversation could be had. Um, in a sort of a truly open, open-minded and sound way. So I think it's certainly worth having the conversation. It's worth working through those risk um, calculi. But, um, but ultimately, I think the fact that missile defense is effectively an article of faith for so many people makes it extremely unlikely that um, the US can actually um, pursue meaningful restrictions on its own missile defense capabilities. Thank you. Well, I think one of my few jobs here is to keep us on time. So with that, I'm going to close the panel. Please give a round of applause to our panelists.
everyone, welcome back. Uh, we'll let people sort of find their way uh, back to their seats, but thank you. I know uh, I, I know I enjoyed both the, all the presentations in the earlier panel. Um, for some of you, I hope you had a chance to hear some of it because I think it tees up some interesting questions and issues uh, as we kind of get into the, this next session. Um, this panel is really sort of how do we dig in a bit further, right? How do we think more about, as we've, what we've laid out, I think very well, kind of some of the broader geo geopolitical trends and dynamics that are underway. And so then the question becomes, how do we kind of dig into that a little bit more? What are the prospects? Um, what types of things might be important? And what's the relationship between uh, US nuclear force posture, broader, um, both conventional military posture? How do we think about our own nuclear policy and our nuclear posture in the context of arms control, especially as we talked about in the, at the beginning of the session, an arms control that really is oriented in its kind of traditional roots. Uh, the roots of arms control that it's about um, preventing conflict, minimizing the risks of conflict, the damage if conflict unfolds, um, and uh, preventing or lowering costs of uh, preparing for war and nuclear war. So when we think about that arms control in that way, what are the tools that become available? What are some of the details, some of the mechanics? What are some things we could introduce to try to achieve those three ends? Um, that could include elements of disarmament, uh, could include reductions, but it isn't necessarily limited to that. We have a terrific panel, so I'm really excited. They are going to answer all these questions for us, and we will walk out uh, you know, ready to go. Um, let me just uh, briefly make a couple of introductions. We'll go in a slightly different order. Um, so first up will be Frank Rose, who is a senior fellow for security and strategy and foreign policy uh, at the Brookings Institution. Uh, he came there from a long uh, career in government on the Hill, the State Department, and has worked a number of these issues, I think, from both sides. So I think we'll bring that a great perspective. Um, pleased to welcome Oriana Maestro as well. Uh, she is an assistant professor of security studies at uh, Georgetown and with a specialization in, in China and Asia. And following Oriana, we will have Vince Manzo. Uh, Vince is, is sort of known to many of you also who've been in Pony, kind of grown up through Pony, uh, including here at CSIS at the beginning. But uh, today, uh, Vince is a research scientist at the Center for Naval Analyses and has actually just this week I believe, yes. Um, yes. issued a report that he's going to talk about um, an outstanding study looking at this direct question of, of posture and, and arms control. And then um, Alex Bell, the senior policy director at the Center for Arms Control and Nonproliferation, who was also a longtime State Department employee and a long history in these issues as well, will kind of uh, bring it home and uh, uh, kind of inspire us to the importance of arms control, I feel pretty confident that she might wind up there. Uh, then we'll open it up. I'm going to you know, kind of badger them with questions for a few minutes. And then uh, while well, I urge you to get your pens ready, and we'll engage a broader dialogue. So with that, I would like to hand it over to Frank. Thank you for being with us. Well, Rebecca, thanks so much for having me here back at CSIS. And it's a real delight to be on the panel with my fellow panelists. Um, let me start by saying I think we are at an end of an era with regards to arms control. I believe that the framework put in place in the late 80s and early 1990s is coming to an end. And I've long thought that New START might likely be the last of the Cold War style bilateral nuclear arms control agreements. Uh, that, that said, we have many of the same challenges we had in the past, but also new challenges such as emerging actors like China, but also new technologies like cyber and outer space. Therefore, I do think we're going to have to think differently about arms control. And as the last panel said, I think we want to call it something else. Uh, we really need to focus on first principles. Uh, when I was Assistant Secretary of State, the bureau that I ran was the Bureau of Arms Control, Verification, and Compliance. But I would always tell my staff, 
those things, arms control, verification, and compliance, they're really tools. And our end state is to reduce risk and enhance stability. Um, I think there are a number of tools that we have to help us in this area. Uh, Brookings uh, put out a report a couple of months ago called Managing Risk that outlines several proposals for doing that. Um, but you know, one example that I want to put on the table that I'm sure many, in this peop many people in this room are not familiar with is how we have done space security and space sustainability over the past 40 years or so. Uh, there are a few legally binding treaties in the space world, um, but for the most part, since the mid-1970s uh, and early 80s, we have adopted an approach called soft law, in which we put together confidence building measures, best practices guidelines like the UN Debris Mitigation Guidelines, uh, the UN Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space Long-Term Sustainability Guidelines that help manage many of the challenges we face. Things like uh, debris generating ASAT tests like India tested last week, uh, improving spi uh, flight safety. So, you know, as we move forward I, and we think differently about uh, arms control or stability or risk reduction, whatever you like to call it, I think there are some lessons that we can learn from the space arena. Uh, secondly, and this is another issue that I've been very concerned about since my time as Assistant Secretary of State. And that is, over the last 25 years or so, especially since the end of the Cold War, we've seen a decoupling of arms control and deterrence. Uh, if you look at many, if not, I would say most of the arms control agreements during the Cold War, whether it be the INF Treaty, the START I Treaty, the START II Treaty, the CFE Treaty, each of those treaties had a very clear defense policy goal. And I think that was a good thing. It helped enhance stability. However, with the end of the Cold War, we moved away somewhat from that paradigm, and we got a little bit too focused in both Democrat and Republican administrations on reducing numbers versus enhancing stability. And I think, you know, as we move forward with regards to arms control, risk reduction, stability, whatever you would like to call it, I think we need to have a recoupling of these two very, very important aspects. And I want to give a shout out to Vince in his report that he published the other day. I think he does a nice job in the report um, trying to recouple and think about deterrence and arms control as a cohesive pass uh, package, not two separate pieces. I wrote an article a couple of uh, months ago called Two Halves of the Same Walnut. And I basically say you, you have to think about arms control and deterrence as one package. Arms control and, and deterrence have been most effective when they work hand in hand. Um, with regards to modernization, uh, we're going to have a big debate in the Congress in the coming months. Um, and, you know, lots of uh, uh, questions about price tag. Uh, but I think, you know, when we move forward, we have to have some first principles. And I think we have to ensure that whatever modernization program we end up with focuses on two key points, and that is something that enhances stability and reduces the risk of nuclear use and also reassures allies. Uh, because one of my big concerns is if the United States fails to reassure allies, that could have a negative impact on our nonproliferation goals. And then finally, um, 
we need to talk about China. Now, I don't agree with Senator Cotton's suggestion that we should only extend New START if we bring China into the New START Treaty. That's not going to happen for a variety of reasons. However, China is most likely going to be the largest strategic competitor of the United States. And if arms control, strategic stability, or risk reduction is going to have a role in managing um, that competition in the future, I don't think the next set of agreements can be strictly bilateral. We're going to have to find a way to bring China into that framework. Now, I am not under any misunderstanding that China is going to sign a legally binding arms control agreement in the next five years. But I think there are a number of things that we can do in the near term to begin that discussion with the Chinese. Uh, for example, we could establish a link between the U.S. Nuclear Risk Reduction Center here at the State Department with an entity in China. We could potentially invite the Chinese to observe a new start inspection. We could have trilateral talks between the U.S., China, and Russia on strategic stability. My bottom line is this. At the end of the day, we are going to have to find a way to engage China. So let me stop there and turn the floor over to Oriana. Thank you. Um, and thank you for teeing it up since I'm going to be talking about China. I think it uh, means a lot, the fact that I've been working on China military security issues for about 15 years now, and this is the first time I've ever been asked to talk about arms control. And I think this kind of exemplifies the Chinese thinking on this issue. So what I'm going to do today is briefly describe how Chinese leaders, media talk about arms control, and then conclude maybe with some very nascent thoughts about how we could potentially move forward uh, with cooperating with China in this space. The bottom line, like Frank said, is China is not going to join any arms control agreements, largely because it doesn't want its strategic advantage in Asia to be hemmed in any way by such agreements. Right now, um, the United States has decided a, a couple months ago that we are in a great power competition with China, but China has been in that competition with the United States for, for quite some time. And they, see, they still see themselves, and I think accurately so, in a conventionally inferior position. And also, in terms of nuclear weapons, a vastly inferior position. So from the Chinese perspective, the idea that they should come to the table and talk about any sort of constraints or limitations on their military capabilities at, at a time where they are in that inferior position is something that uh, they don't seem very supportive of. However, one of the things that's very interesting when you look at Chinese narratives or what Chinese leaders say about an issue, a lot of times they can say two different things that seem like they're in conflict with one another. So for example, when I first started working on uh, Chinese space doctrine, I would read all these uh, documents that would outline how the United States was very vulnerable, on, uh, very vulnerable because it was so reliant on space and so China could target a lot of those systems at a time of conflict. And then a paragraph later, there would be a whole section about how China wanted to have the same space infrastructure as the United States, with no recognition of the fact that that would lead to very similar vulnerabilities and certain contingencies that the United States has. This, I think, uh, seemingly contradictory um, approach to some of these ideas, you can see this in arms control as well, in that Chinese um, foreign ministry leaders, military leaders writing you know, op-eds and things of that sort, they talk a lot about arms races and how arms races are bad. They're bad for stability, they're bad for China, they're bad for the region, they're bad for US-China relations, and because of that, China supports arms control in order to avoid that arms racing type of cycle. But in this context, they talk about arms control for other countries. Right? The arms race is a problematic potential outcome 
if arms control isn't adhered to, but in the Chinese view, it's the other countries that have to adhere to that arms control for these arms races uh, to not occur. So in general, the Chinese are very reluctant to discuss arms control in the context of their own military modernization. When they talk about their own military modernization, they actually talk about the opposite, which is the need to build more arms. So on one hand, they say arms races is bad. We need to have arms control for other countries while China needs to build even more arms. And in many cases, they talk about certain systems um, that I think, based on what Frank said, he, you know, he would see as kind of destabilizing things like hypersonics or even you know, counter space weapons and, and, and uh, also uh, many different sort of the hypersonics and other ways of defeating uh, missile defense. So if you look at, you know, I have um, sort of charted the number of times that they talk about these issues over the past 10 years. And you can see that there is this huge spike in talking about the need for other countries to stop building weapons. In their own documents, they lay out very clearly, they have a white paper on arms control, disarmament, and, and nonproliferation, in which it says that China supports the, quote, complete prohibition and thorough destruction of WMD. And they also say that they share the aspiration of the international community to thoroughly destroy nuclear weapons and be free of nuclear weapons. In practice, we know, however, China's compliance with this type of vision is conditional. In some cases, historically and, and even today, China has been willing to share certain technological know-how to gain strategic advantage vis-a-vis -vis the United States. They've supported um, the development of certain arms programs in countries like Pakistan, Iran, and North Korea. And they've been reluctant in some cases to join, for example, the PSI because of what it would do with their, for their relationship with North Korea. So I think for a large part of Chinese thinking on arms control, it does seem to be about how it can constrain them strategically and how their use of weapons development um, could benefit them in terms of the balance of power with the United States. In their critiques of arms control, they focus very heavily um, on the United States, but also South Korea and Japan. So the arms racing that I was discussing before, very little is noted, for example, for the South China Sea or even Taiwan. Most of what they're discussing is the fact that US policy is contributing to the remilitarization of Japan. And then also because of the recent THAAD incident, South Korea comes up a lot in the context of arms control. So China really blames the United States um, for creating these destabilizing trends uh, in terms of arms racing. And more recently, with President Trump um, pulling away from the INF, there's a lot of discussion about how uh, the United States and its policies is contributing to arms racing and undermining security. While in the Chinese view, their position has been relatively reasonable, in particular about nuclear weapons. Because as we know, China maintains sort of a minimal deterrent uh, posture um, and only have, there's a debate in the open source about how many nuclear weapons, but could be you know, around 250 nuclear warheads. And this is obviously vastly inferior to how many the United States has. So China blames the United States for seeking what they call absolute security at the price of other countries' insecurity. When they talk about the United States quitting the INF, uh, the, there's, there's, they point, for example, to the fact that it's not popular domestically, not popular internationally, but they are very clear to articulate that this has nothing to do with China. Now, as we know in the United States, uh, now, the rationale was that Russia was cheating, but for a lot of strategists who are focused on contingencies in China, there was some thought about the strategic benefits to the United States to be able to have ground-based um, you know, intermediate missiles in the region. Now, I can talk more in question and answer about my own views on that. I don't think it's actually very beneficial because the United States problem is not sort of strike options. It's this asymmetry in that the United States is trying to project power from very far, so our reliance on basing, on space assets, et cetera, et cetera, doesn't change um, if we now can develop certain systems that were previously prohibited uh, by the INF. So um, while it might make it so the United States can impose greater costs on China, I don't actually think that cost and position strategy would have much effect. So to conclude, I think, you know, 
this idea there's no hope of getting China to an arms control sort of regime or types of agreements um, because they don't have the same vulnerabilities the United States does. And so they particularly want to exploit the vulnerabilities the US has, whether it is developing counter space weapons um, to blind the United States in a type of conflict, or their um, very advanced ballistic and cruise missile program in which they can target a number of US bases in the region. The good news is they haven't leveraged their nuclear capabilities yet um, to, to make up for any conventional inferiorities. I always say that the day that China acts like Pakistan and threatens to use nuclear weapons whenever things don't go their way, that will be a much more difficult China to manage in peacetime and to plan for in wartime. Also, with the INF, China is likely to very severely punish any actors that are considering hosting any US missiles, and, and so the political aspects of this become very difficult. The remaining questions for me is, um, you know, what could push China towards a, a different nuclear doctrine? And with China, I always like to conclude by saying, never say never. Because as a China specialist, there's always certain things that we say China has never done and will never do. And then Chinese leaders think differently about their role in the world, about their strategy, about their security, and before you know it, their position completely changes on proliferation we can see that this happened in the 1990s, for example. So I think it'd be useful to talk about, instead of never doing arms control, what types of agreements might China uh, be open to? And I would say, for example, anything would have to be proportional versus absolute levels. It has to take into account that the United States has more. So the United States would have to think about constraining itself more than, than uh, China. And I think some agreements could be made about the proliferation of some technologies, for example, hypersonics, the idea that countries like China, Russia, and the United States shouldn't share certain technologies that they're developing. There might be some space um, there as well. But in the end, this impacts more sort of stability around the world when it comes to the competition between China and the United States. It's very difficult to get China to willingly give up any sort of advantage or asymmetry that they have there. Thank you. Very interesting. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Rebecca, and, and thank you again for having me. As you said, I've been uh, participating in Pony events for a while now, and, and I've benefited greatly from them, so I, I'm very grateful for that. So I'll uh, shift gears a little bit and talk about U.S. and Russian nuclear interactions in a world in which there is no uh, strategic nuclear arms control agreement between them. And as Rebecca said, I'm going to be drawing from a study that CNA released uh, earlier this week looking at that scenario. Uh, so I do have some slides that I'm going to look to. So our starting point in this study was to, to say, OK, uh, strategic nuclear arms control treaties have been a valuable tool in, in the US-Russia relationship. They've helped provide both countries uh, confidence that their forces are sufficient to meet their security objectives both today and looking out into the future. And, and they've done this through both setting limits on nuclear weapons and providing a unique window of transparency into each country's uh, respective nuclear postures. So we posed a, a basic research question, what happens if all this goes away? And we looked uh, particularly at risks that would arise and then some policy options that don't require a treaty for managing those risks. And a big part of our methodology was to, to lay out some illustrative US-Russian uh, nuclear postures out into the 2020s and, and compare them uh, and as we compared them, we were looking uh, specifically at how is each country going to assess uh, whether it can sustain a survivable second strike capability without an arms control agreement, and whether it can sustain nuclear parity with the other without an arms control agreement. And I'm happy to kind of go into the details of how we did that during the discussion, but I'll just give you the, the top level takeaways now. Um, so from a, a perspective of parity, Without a treaty, both countries are going to have the, the ability to uh, increase their deployed strategic warhead levels by hundreds, uh, but neither country can fundamentally alter the nuclear balance by exceeding new start levels if the other chooses to do so as well. From a survivability perspective, uh, both countries are going to have a lot of survivable weapons uh, simply because of, of the, the investments they've made in, in mobile delivery vehicles. So in that sense, I don't see an acute sense of strategic vulnerability for either country in the immediate aftermath uh, of New Start's expiration if there's nothing to take its place. However, I, I do see, uh, based on both countries' policies, uh, the United States and Russia having strong incentives to exceed New Start levels without a treaty. 
And as we get out towards the end of the 2020s and out into the 2030s, I see both countries as having some real risks and some real uncertainties uh, that it would have to grapple with. So for the United States, uh, I would see our motivation to exceed New START levels primarily to be uh, a desire to maintain rough numeric parity with, with Russian warhead levels uh, outside a treaty framework. Now, the United States has sig uh, significant capacity if it decides to reverse its New START reductions, but again, over the long term, we would face some real uncertainties. So the first of those would simply be we might see steady and sustained growth in, in Russia's uh, strategic nuclear forces out into the 2020s and the 2030s, uh, both in, in warheads and conceivably in delivery vehicles. Right now, Russia is largely just recapitalizing its ballistic missile force with modern systems, but they might want to spend the money on increasing the overall size. Um, that's something that they, they have the option of doing, and, and, and all those missiles have ample upload capacity. They can put more warheads on them. Now, that would occur alongside the, the planned reductions that will occur um, in the U.S. modernization program. So when we get out into the 2030s, as we start transitioning to the Columbia-class SSBN, uh, that submarine is going to have fewer launch tubes than the Ohio-class. And ultimately, when, we, when all is said and done and we're in a, an all-Columbia-class force, you'll be looking at a reduction of uh, 48 submarine launch ballistic missiles in our deployed force just through our modernization program. And then finally, we may see unplanned uh, unplanned reductions in U.S. forces during the modernization cycle as a result of budgetary shortfalls or programmatic delays. So particularly if we want to maintain rough uh, numeric parity with Russia as a force sizing construct, we do face some real long-term uncertainties. Now, uh, with Russia, I would say their primary motivation for exceeding new start levels if there's no treaty in place would be uh, a need to offset what, what they would perceive as an increased U.S. counterforce threat. I think Russian strategists would look at the capacity the United States could get back if it chose to reverse its new start reductions. And it is some significant capacity. It's both uh, delivery vehicles and warheads. Um, the United States can put roughly 98 ballistic missiles back into its floor force across both its ICBMs and SL SLBMs. It can put some warheads, additional warheads on, on those missiles and its existing missile force. And it can conceivably uh, reconvert 30 B-52H bombers back to a nuclear role. So from a Russian perspective, this could conceivably improve our ability to hold their mobile ICBMs at risk with a, a barrage counterforce attack. And of course, Russia's big uncertainties under this scenario are the fact that it would now be looking at an unconstrained U.S. nuclear force alongside uh, all the other unconstrained capabilities that they worry a lot about already, such as missile defense, conventional strike, intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance, all of which are probably going to uh, continue improving and, and which Russia views as a a threat to its uh, strategic nuclear deterrent. So for those reasons, I do see uh, an alignment of interests for the United States and Russia in staying at new start levels, even if there's not a treaty in place, as a means to sort of reduce risk and uncertainty and, and, and enhance predictability under those circumstances. Now this could take the form of a, a mutual restraint pledge where both countries say they will stay at new start levels, uh, provided the other does so as well. Now from a U.S. perspective, the United States, uh, due to the Arms Control and Disarmament, uh, Disarmament Act, cannot agree to limit or reduce its military forces uh, outside of a treaty or domestic law, but it can make a, a unilateral commitment saying, this is the force level we're going to maintain under these conditions. There's, there's no reason we can't do that. And I think both countries could rely primarily on their national technical means of intelligence gathering to, to detect large scale increases in the other's deployed force. However, you could increase confidence uh, on both sides in, in this mutual restraint pledge through uh, cooperative transparency outside of a treaty context as well. So I'm going to just real quickly uh, wrap up on, on some of the options we looked at for transparency without a treaty. And in the study, we, look, we go through the risks that would arise uh, if you lost New Start's verification regime, which provides transparency through data exchanges, rolling notifications, um, and changes for some of those categories of data and on-site inspections as well. Uh, so we tried to develop a, a, a number of imperfect substitutes for those measures. And we evalu evaluated them according to both uh, their value and their difficulty. And, and basically we defined value as the extent to which it would, these options would augment each side's uh, national technical means of intelligence gathering, reduce opportunity costs for using those national technical means to monitor the other's forces, uh, and the extent to which that would give them a more precise understanding of what the other's doing than they would have otherwise. Now, difficulty we defined largely as whether there'd be some legal challenges to trying to do some of these things outside of a treaty, 
but also whether it would require some complex new procedures uh, to be agreed upon by the United States and Russia, and whether there might be some operational security risks that could arise. So I'm not going to go through all of these. I'll just touch on a few of them. So under, under New START, uh, both countries provide biannual data exchanges to each other. Now, we all see the, the aggregate force levels that are unclassified and the State Department publishes. But there's also, uh, on a confidential basis, they, they tell each other how many uh, warheads each ha they have deployed across each type of uh, delivery vehicle that's accountable under the treaty. And they even go down to the base level and, and talk about uh, how many warheads are deployed at, on delivery vehicles out at a declared base. So for instance, think of uh, Minot Air Force Base out in uh, North Dakota. So one option would be to continue doing these data exchanges even if there's no treaty in place. And, and one way uh, that they could actually improve each other's ability to sort of independently monitor uh, changes in deployed warhead levels would be to shift from a, a regime that largely re uh, relies on notification of changes in deployed warhead levels after the fact in these biannual data exchanges to one that provides notification uh, before the changes happen. And what this would do would allow each country to position national technical means and conceivably monitor some of the observable activity that would happen. For instance, if you were sending some more wa uh, warheads out to, uh, to uh, missiles deployed out at, at Minot Air Force Base in North Dakota or other declared missile bases. Um, and ultimately what that would do is I think increase both sides' confidence in the data exchanges and inc increase both sides' confidence in, uh, in a mutual restraint pledge. Now, I think this would be valuable, but there would be some difficulties, uh, particularly I'll focus on, on a potential legal difficulty to doing this outside of a treaty. Uh, so based on, on the research I did, um, sharing confidential information about the, the numbers and locations of deployed warhead levels would probably require Congress to amend the Atomic Energy Act. Now, I want to be clear, I'm not a legal scholar, and so ultimately this is something that would be, need to be analyzed by the U.S. government, uh, but I'm fairly certain that it would require uh, Congress to act in order to make this kind of arrangement legal. However, I, I did uh, identify some options that I think would be high value but, but low difficulty, fairly easy to do. So under, under New START, uh, as, as many of you know, we also exchange notifications about changes in the status of deployed missiles and deployed launchers. So whether they go from deployed to non-deployed or non-deployed to deployed, where they go, what, what facility they're housed at. Um, we provide notification, again, it's a post-notification regime after these things happen. You could continue to provide these notifications but shift to the pre-notification uh, regime, which would ultimately help both countries monitor these things as they're happening, uh, improve their level of understanding into the other's deployed force levels and dispositions, and, and ultimately strengthen confidence. And this would be low difficulty uh, because, again, based on the, the research I did, information, uh, confidential information about just the, the delivery vehicles, not the warheads, uh, can be shared without an act of Congress simply as a matter of policy if, if, uh, if the president decided that doing so was in U.S. national security interest. So it's something the United States and Russia could simply continue doing. Uh, the same applies to uh, the practice under New START of providing 48-hour notification before additional delivery vehicles leave their production facilities. We could just continue doing that. So those were some of the options that I think would improve confidence. Now we did in the report also look at uh, what the United States might do with its strategic forces if we don't have a willing partner uh, in Russia and they're unwilling to cooperate. Um, and I think that's a pretty interesting question, but I, I know I've gone a little over, so I'm going to hold my fire on that and uh, we'll probably discuss it during the Q&A. Terrific. Thank you very much. Okay, Alex, over to you. Uh, yeah, thank you to CSIS and, and to Pony for having me here today. It's an honor to be on this panel uh, with my co-panelists and great to see so many young people here interested in arms control. Um, I was asked to uh, answer a super simple question, uh, how to prevent arms racing. Uh, <laughs> but when you actually think about it, the solution is pretty simple. You uh, prevent arms racing by engaging in arms control. And of course, that's easier said than done. Uh, but we have to stop thinking about this in a sort of zero-sum situation, that if we haven't solved all of our arms control problems, all of our security problems, that somehow we've failed. Uh, in the U.S.-Russia context, we're faced with uh, strategic nuclear weapons and their, the risks posed by strategic nuclear weapons and their associated delivery systems. Uh, the threat of a renewed arms race uh, with intermediate range missiles and a whole new generation of del delivery systems and warheads, uh, some of which lie entirely outside of uh, current and past arms control uh, structures. Altogether, finding a way to deal 
uh, with the risk presented by all of those weapons can seem like a daunting, if not completely insurmountable challenge. That's why I think we have to look at this in pieces. And uh, so one, we should avoid making impulsive and ill-planned moves. Two, we should protect and uh, support and maintain the structures that we have in place. And three, we should push for a sustained, persistent, and constructive dialogue with Russia, as well as uh, all nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states. Uh, easy, right? Uh, of course, uh, we're not doing so well uh, in those areas right now, and uh, can't deny that almost every arms control agreement that we have is under duress. Uh, why is that? Well, for one, uh, nothing happens in a vacuum. Conventional and unconventional conflicts, disrespect for international norms and international borders, uh, politics and personalities all affect arms control agreements. Leaders come and go, publics lose faith, they lose interest, real estate heirs become president, and the list goes on. Uh, I won't say that arms control agreements are in a good place now. Again, uh, they're not, but that said, despair is completely unwarranted and quite frankly, a little self-indulgent. Uh, at times I worry about the prevalence of this kind of emo, Nietzsche, John Bolton hybrid that goes around <laughs> saying that all arms control is dead. Um, it's strange because a lot of those same people uh, say that arms control is not an end state, it's a tool. Um, I agree, it is a tool. And when we have cause to use it, we can, we should, and I think we actually will. Uh, we aren't dealing with the death of our arms control, we're dealing with the problem that people around the world who are charged with reducing nuclear risks have lost drive, or they're being stubborn, or they're being reckless, or some combination of the three. Uh, whether you think one is already happening, or think one is on the way, a new nuclear arms race doesn't serve the interests of any human on this planet. So where does this leave us? First, as I said, we should avoid making impulsive and ill-planned moves. On INF, that ship may have sailed, doesn't mean we shouldn't try to catch it. And we have until August to try to save this agreement, this landmark agreement. There's still diplomatic cards on the table, and we have not exhausted all of our possible moves. If we cannot manage to save the INF Treaty, we can take steps to prevent the situation from becoming worse. We can talk to the Russians about an agreement to keep intermediate range missiles out of Europe. We can talk to them about a new agreement to limit some deployments. We can talk about the risks posed by global intermediate range missiles uh, stockpiles. Uh, the point is that we should be talking to them. Now the response to that is the Russians don't want to talk. We try, they don't want to talk. Um, that's true. They caused this entire crisis by building the 9M729 in the first place. And they made it worse by not talking to us. Uh, but I think it's hard to say that this administration exhausted every possible option it had for engaging in a dialogue on this before the president announced would draw from this treaty on the sidelines of a political rally in Elko, Nevada. Uh, we know how destabilizing these weapons are. As of a month ago, according to General Scaparotti, we didn't have a plan to control Russian production and deployment of new INF violating missiles. Um, seems like finding a way uh, to talk to them, finding some way to talk to them about this is cheaper and safer than engaging in an arms race. Second, we maintain and protect the structures we have. That starts with the extension of New START. Vince obviously elaborated in great detail about the consequences of not extending the treaty. Um, I'll cover the basics. New START's working as it was designed. We've reached the cent central limits. The inspections and data exchanges are providing us with real-time image of the Russian strategic arsenal uh, and vice versa. And it would cost us billions of dollars, billions and billions of dollars to replicate the kind of intelligence that we're getting from New START and it wouldn't be as good. Uh, most importantly, the lack of a cap on strategic deployed warheads could trigger, again, an undebatable arms race and all the painstaking work that we've put into this process to save ourselves from ourselves over the last half century will have been for naught. Uh, so the United States and the Russia should just quit it with the posturing and extend this treaty already, yesterday. Uh, third and finally, we need to push for sustained, persistent, and constructive dialogue with Russia and indeed all nuclear weapon states. The US and Russian strategic relationship is too important to be averaging one or no official dialogues on strategic stability each year. If the conversations about some issues aren't going well, 
then we find another topic to talk about and we work that for a bit. The same goes for our P5 dialogue. We have lots to talk about. Uh, to begin, it's important to look at how global security environment is being reshaped by the emerging technologies uh, that we're looking at, such as drones, precision strike, hypersonics, improved ballistic, miss uh, ballistic missile defenses, lethal autonomous systems, and artificial intelligence. All of these technologies have the potential to undermine decades of nuclear orthodoxy. Uh, expertise on nuclear deterrence is not a requirement to see the danger of nuclear weapons that can be delivered without human control. Uh, and while we're at it, bringing some new and diverse perspectives into this conversation wouldn't be the worst thing. Uh, that's why I'm glad so many of you guys are here today. Uh, these problems aren't going away anytime soon, and we really need a new generation of people with fresh ideas to join the fight. With that, I'll stop, but I look forward to our conversation. Great, thank you. I think you have put a lot on the table. I'd like to ask each of you a couple of questions, maybe one question for the group, and then we'll uh, throw it open to the audience. So please uh, start thinking about how you would like to engage this conversation. Um, the first thing, uh, and it's probably one that, um, Frank, for you and Alex, I think yeah. might be an interesting, because I'm gonna go to some of the politics yeah. a little bit here. Um, you know, in our keynote discussion, um, Senator Fisher really gave an, an articulate um, articulation of her concerns with creating a sort of, or perpetuating a kind of politically transactional dynamic between arms control and modernization. And it was an interesting twist because I had usually thought of that, uh, you know, sort of famous consensus, right, as amount of, of kind of a positive bargain. Um, and so it was interesting to hear it discussed in a lens that really saw that as the politicization yeah. of it. Um, I'm interested in your reactions to that in a couple of different ways. You know, one potential risk of that, of that decoupling, um, of that saying it isn't a political transaction is um, instead of just getting to depolitization, we actually just get to a big game of chicken, um, you know, where each side is sort of holding out in, in a way that kind of actually ups the political ante rather than taking it down. And that obviously is something that would, I think, might be a concern on either side. Um, so let me just start with that. Uh, yeah. What's your take on that and the sort of now infamous and perhaps highly fragile, if it ever existed, consensus about modernization and arms control? Well, let me go to a point that I think Rebecca Listener made uh, in her presentation on the previous panel. There has always been a link between modernization and nuclear arms control. I actually did a, a paper uh, about a year ago going back to the SALT I agreement. And basically what I learned from my research is that the Nixon administration used the Trident system in order to get SALT I. Uh, and I think there is a strong argument had they not moved forward with uh, 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 the modernization or the procurement of Trident, you probably would not have gotten the Democratic hawks like Scoop Jackson and other hawks to approve the SALT I agreement. So uh, it's always been there, and you have to deal with it, number one. Uh, number two, I think the politics in Democratic countries require this. If you look at the history of arms control and modernization in the United States, there's that link. But also, and I think this is really important to note, it's very important in a number of allied nations. For example, Germany. Big debate in Germany right now, led by the Social Democratic Party, as to whether one, Germany should continue in the NATO nuclear sharing arrangements, and two, whether they should uh, purchase a new dual capable aircraft to uh, replace the tornado, or tornado, depends. You say tomato, I say tomato. Um, but it's really, really important. And what I try to remind people in this country because uh, I had a lot of experience working with the Allies on deterrence and arms control issues, is that support for arms control and non-proliferation agreements 
has been very, very important uh, for countries like Germany, Norway, the Netherlands, in Japan to put together a domestic uh, consensus in favor of deterrence. And again, I'll come back to the point uh, I made. Uh, you really cannot, in my view, especially in democratic countries, separate deterrence from arms control. Uh, I guess I would flip it on the other side that, you know, the idea is mostly kind of like if you do modernization, you get arms control. I sort of take it back to, to why we're doing this, and I know it's been invoked a million times, but the 2007 op-ed by Perry Kissinger, Nunn, and Schultz outlining why we have to take these steps to reduce the all num overall numbers eventually getting to zero is that, that you know, non-state actors are not by their very nature deterrable. And the more weapons and material that are out there, the more likely it is that somebody's gonna get a hold of it at some point. So we need to, and use it, and we need to be doing everything we can to reduce that possibility. Um, it's not out of, you know, some sort of grand moral design. You know, in, in their eyes, it's just good security for the United States. So when you're making modernization plans, when you're pushing for weapons, um, that are not seen to be uh, in keeping with our arms control and disarmament obligations, um, you're just sort of jerking NNSA and our military around for no reason. You send them down a road only to know that a, a future administration is gonna say that this isn't in line with our, with our international commitments, so we're gonna pull that whole thing back. Like, let's actually start making decisions with both of these things in mind, reducing overall risk, maintaining a safe, secure, and effective arsenal for as long as it's necessary, and uh, you know that, that we need each other to make this all work. And every time you go on some sort of you know, mission to build the ROW or build the RNAV or build the low-yield D5, you're setting yourself up for NNSA to do a lot of work that a future administration can just zero out. It just doesn't seem like good security planning to me. Okay, can I just yeah. come back on that point? Um, you know, one of the things that I am concerned about is that you have a very, let's say, strong reduction in bipartisan support for arms control, very little Republican support on Capitol Hill right now. There are a few, but many of them left uh, after the election. Uh, so you're going to have to find a way to bring the Republicans on board. I'm a very practical person. Uh, I spent a lot of my time working on Capitol Hill, helping develop consensus to get a bill through the House Armed Services Committee. Uh, and I think it's great to have grand visions, but you're going to have to be really practical, especially when you have one party which has a very, very skeptical view on arms control. Okay, thank you. Oriana. I was really kind of fascinated with an aspect of, of your presentation about China. Um, this sort of amazing capacity to sit on the sidelines and kind of not feel not a need to participate and yet to feel highly interested uh, in the outcomes. And it found myself thinking, you know, what is the, the China Pershing? What's the, what is the thing that makes China want to get off the sidelines and into arms control because all of a sudden it says, "Oh, I have it. I, I'm actually, you know, engaged here." Um, because in some ways it's interesting. It's almost setting up a situation where it has to escalate farther, either from an arms racing perspective or from a risk perspective, before China starts to say, "Hmm, maybe I need to figure out how to actually be a participant." in this as opposed to a sideliner. What would get their attention? So the problematic thing about that is the types of things that would get their attention are the types of things that the United States needs to prevail in a conventional conflict in Asia, right? So, so I'm trying to think about a specific system, but I'll talk more strategically. So right now, um, what China is trying to do is, is limit the amount that the United States can deter them. I mean, I always look at the Taiwan Straits crisis of 1996 and say that this is an unintended consequence of successful deterrence. The United States has been successfully deterring China 
for decades, and China would like to not be so successfully deterred. So if there is something, at this point, you know, the balance has tipped, so a lot of those regional contingencies, China has a local advantage. And so if the United States developed some system, and honestly, for me, it's less about strike options and actually more about defense, right? So one of the big issues is the United States relies on our, our posture in the region to project power. China has China, so they don't, they don't have that, that same type of vulnerability. If the United States came up with like, you know, technologies such as, and I'm not a scientist, so this is, I'm always like, this is what I want, and then you'd have to ask DARPA if we could actually do it. But if you could do things like, if I could have aircraft that could fly, that don't need to be refueled, because tankers are, create a vulnerability, but we invent some new systems such that we have like, more effective fueling, and the United States can fly around, and we can operate as effectively from Australia that we can from Japan. Or if uh, you know, the United States develops certain missile defense systems that really become um, effective against not only the technologies of like cruise missiles or, or the ballistic missiles, but also the quantity. So China just has so much of things that they can easily saturate um, whatever we might have in place and that countries are willing to host those. So if something like that happens and China all of a sudden sees that the United States has developed certain capabilities that make it so we, we are less vulnerable in our power projection capabilities, then maybe they would want to come to the table. But the flip side of that is, once the United States is able to do something like that, you know, we're not going to be, after all these decades of being vulnerable vis-a-vis -vis China, I don't think we're going to be willing to give that up. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I got distracted yeah. by the, the, uh, the, the sound, talking. I right. <laughs> right. So, I mean, you never know what direction technology is going to go, but I see it less about certain systems that we currently have and like if we had more of this missile and less of that missile and it's more that it would really have to be a reduction of U.S. vulnerability in our power projection capabilities and whatever those technologies are, that's what China would want to constrain. Thank you. Um, Vince, for you, I would like to tease out a little bit more what the sort of breakout risks are um, in the absence of, of New START. How do you see that might play out um, and, and more specifically, where the United States can reduce risk. Um, just to elaborate that, because I think you went through that pretty quickly, do you know where are the, the ways in which we can reduce a breakout risk? To what extent um, can we account for those risks in ways others than chasing parity um, if they were to, to break out? Um, I think also my question is to what extent, and I, and I just don't think you went all the way here, to what extent, you know, do you even have a concern? It sounds a bit like hard to imagine, but a concern in which um, a, a parity approach might actually outstrip our delivery systems or be sufficiently imbalanced in our existing upload capacity that we would we would really feel like we disturbed um, the strategic balance in the triad. <clears throat> Um, could you touch on some of those questions for us? Sure. Thanks, Rebecca. So when I looked at, at Russian strategic nuclear forces uh, under conditions where they aren't constrained by a treaty, I mean, principally what they would do to exceed new start levels would be to take warheads and put them onto their ballistic missile force. They would MIRV. That's kind of the capacity they've built into their force structure. Um, they're still probably going to be well under the, the, the limit of delivery vehicles. Like, they're not anywhere close to... 700 uh, deployed strategic delivery vehicles. So that, that's what they get uh, in the near term and I think a little bit out into the long term is, is uploading more warheads onto their force. And so the question becomes, what impact does that have on US strategic nuclear forces? Uh, and, and the sense I, I came out with is that it doesn't really have a huge one provided we maintain the, the new start uh, force structure. And this is what I, what I was kind of thinking through when I said, well, if Russia doesn't want to show any kind of restraint outside of a treaty and goes ahead and maxes out its upload capacity, what are our options? And, and, and the option that I found uh, really interesting um, and, and quite persuasive was the United States could simply just stay at new start levels and maintain its new start force structure. And, and the, the way I thought it through was, does the United States still have the force structure to deter uh, both large scale nuclear attack and limited nuclear attack? So in, in this uh, table, I sort of mapped out uh, a comparison where you have the unconstrained Russian strategic nuclear force used in an attack against the, the U.S. New START force structure. So you can see up on the, uh, in the second row, it, it's, it's the, use, the new, uh, U.S. New START force structure under those conditions. Uh, Russia still has to use um, 
or I'd say there's still roughly 410 fixed targets in the United States that Russia would have to attack to uh, destroy our, RCB, our ICBMs, our bomber bases, and our, our submarine bases. Assuming they're going to need two to three warheads per target, that drives them to a, an attack upwards of, of somewhere between 800 and 1,200 warheads, and leaving them with, with roughly 300 warheads in their day-to-day -day force remaining. So if you assume the only thing we have under those conditions uh, survivable is, is five submarines at sea armed with uh, 100 SLBMs and, and roughly 450 warheads, is, which is it's an estimate, but that's kind of where we're at with the new start limits. Uh, you know, there's no circumstances in which a, a Russian leader could conceivably conclude that they could carry, it, uh, carry out like the most destructive attack in, in human history and, and deter the United States from responding uh, with those weapons. So I think we're in a fairly stable position. And, and really, this, uh, this surprised me, but it shouldn't have, because when I went back and was doing my research, General Chilton, during the New START debate uh, back in 2010, said, well, if, if Russia does to accede to, to ex uh, if Russia decides to break out of the New START treaty, it doesn't really affect the survivability of our bombers and our SSBNs. Um, and so fundamentally, a decision to exceed New START levels for the United States would be a, a political decision, uh, not so much driven by operational concerns. Mm -hmm. So that's deterring large-scale attack. Discur uh, deterring limited nuclear attack, much more of a qualitative question, very much a, a function of your foreign policy and your commitment to your allies. It depends on a lot of different things, but we do have some force structure requirements uh, that, that have, have sort of been long held in the United States, and it's limited response options. So fundamentally, having limited U.S. response options, again, is not affected by the number of deployed Russian warheads. It's, it's affected by having effective delivery vehicles that can uh, penetrate Russian air defenses. So provided you have uh, a, an air launch cruise missile um, and conceivably move forward with the the low yield submarine launch ballistic missile, you're gonna have those effective uh, penetrating delivery vehicles. Now, the, the final thing I'll say on this is in the third, uh, the third row on, on that table, I did look at, well, how does this picture change if the United States no longer has a triad of strategic delivery vehicles? So I looked at a dyad uh, where there's no ICBMs, and you can tell that the operational picture is very different. Um, Russia would only have about 10 fixed targets they would need to attack uh, in the continental United States to hit our bomber bases, our sub bases, and a couple other targets. Could do it with roughly 30 warheads, and then they would have uh, approximately 1,500 weapons remaining in their day-to-day -day force. Not their generated force, but their day-to-day -day force. So again, you still have 450 survivable warheads at sea, and the question becomes, uh, could a Russian leader convince himself that under these conditions they could launch a, a much smaller attack, have 1,500 weapons remaining, and deter the United States from, from using those 450 warheads in response? Uh, and my sense is we could have a strategic debate about that, but the operational picture is, is very, very different. And particularly if you think you're in a crisis and a Russian leader is under an acute sense of pressure, they might think to themselves, well, I can prevent the United States from tripling their number of survivable weapons if I go early. I'm not going to hit major population centers, and then I'm going to have a significant advantage remaining uh, in remaining forces to deter them from, from responding. And again, we don't know whether that would actually resonate with the Russian leader or not, but the operational picture is different. So that's kind of my sort of long way of saying, it. provided we sustain the, the new start force structure, which moving out into the future does require recapitalizing it, you're in a pretty strong position to, to manage nuclear risks, uh, meet your, your, your deterrence requirements, uh, even if Russia's exceeded new start levels. Okay, thank you, that's very helpful. All right, I have a question for, over, uh, for all of you to kind of think of. It's really one of the takeaways that I put together between the two panels. Um, and uh, as just a heads up, those of you who were in the earlier panel, I may sort of look around to you and to see if you would react to this as well, because I think it's really at the intersection of some of these regional um, and country-oriented perspectives with some of these others. Um, so kind of putting that together. So here's the thing. When I look at this broader picture today of arms control, we seem to have such a large disconnect between the actual participants in arms control, who is actually a participant in an agreement, whether it's formal or informal, and the stakeholders. The stakeholders who are deeply invested in the outcome, but not necessarily a participant in the structure itself. And this has come up in so many different ways. Um, you know, we, we haven't talked about it today, but just to you know, make sure we understand, you know, it's us too. Um, you know, there's 
think of how all of us would be tremendous stakeholders in arms control, especially traditional arms control between India and Pakistan after what we all just experienced, right? We would not be a participant necessarily in that arms control, but we certainly are a stakeholder in the outcome and care a lot about how it might, might unfold or how arms control could help to reduce risks in crisis or in terms of arms race stability. Um, Rebecca talked about, Rebecca Gibbons talked about um, some of the, the ban treaty issues and brought that up, not really arms control, but one thing to keep in mind, the ban treaty, the participants, People who actually engaged and participated and you know were engaged in signing the treaty are in many ways exclude primary stakeholders as in all of the countries that actually have nuclear weapons that would have to be gotten rid of. Um, and so that's kind of a, a, a problem, right, where the stakeholders and participants are not in alignment. I think we've seen it acutely in the context of, of Europe and INF and Europe and New START, right, where so many of our partners um, feel acutely engaged in terms of stakes uh, in the arms in arms control in the outcome of those treaties in their persistence, and yet they're not really participants in them, and they've been able to sideline themselves until they got upset, and then decide they care a lot. So it's an interesting problem. And the final one that came up, and I think um, John Warden's uh, comments and talk about North Korea kind of teased this up because. You know, if you went down a road of arms control with North Korea, now you have a situation, do you make who else in the region, and this takes me, Oriana, in a way to you, who else in the region is a participant in that arms control? In other words, does that have to be multilateralized um, because you have these other stakeholders, China, Japan, South Korea, so how would that work? Does it mean that we actually need to engage in more multilateralization of arms control, whether formal or informal, because the stakeholders need to be participants? Are there other ways of dealing with that? Have I gotten that totally wrong? I will turn it over to you guys to kind of explore that, and then I'm gonna give kind of first shout outs to some of the folks who were on the first panel to see if they wanna engage that conversation a little bit. Who'd like to go first? I can, I can start. Um, so there's a few things that I was thinking about when you said that. I mean, the first is something that I should have stated directly, which is a lot of this discussion has been about nuclear weapons. But for China, and in my mind, in the future of conflict in Asia, nuclear weapons are actually not that as important as they were between the Soviet Union and the United States. And that's largely because you know, reading the Chinese writings, looking at how they train, I firmly believe in the reality of the Chinese no first use doctrine, and I also think that they are very reasonable about how they think about nuclear weapons, which is primarily to deter nuclear use and to defend against that. And so when I'm thinking about arms control and I think about the types of systems that we would want, China, you know, my main concern isn't how many warheads China has, right? My main concern is you know, the more emerging technologies and how China might incorporate hypersonics, AI, and things like that to really enhance the lethality of their conventional system. So the first thing is like, what type of systems would you want arms control for? I would love to have a multilateral regime about space. Now Frank said that, you know, we've done well so far in space, but China wasn't really, you know, didn't have a lot of options in the past couple of decades. And I think trying to constrain their ability to develop counter space weapons is very important. And they don't like to be isolated. So when the United States, Japan, Australia, you know, a couple of US allies get together, China's unfazed, because like of course, Japan's on the US side of this. But if it really is multilateral, that can impact China. So what types of systems we want? And then to conclude, I'll just say, when you say get involved, the Chinese would love to get involved. But again, to, to play this role of mediator and constraining others. They would love to help Russia and, and the United States have a discussion about reducing nuclear weapons, or the United States and North Korea, or you know Japan. So they, they like to play that role and be very actively involved, uh, but not necessarily be a signatory themselves. It's very generous, though. Right. Yeah. Well, let me build on one point that Ariadne uh, made, and then uh, provide a couple of additional points. Uh, first, I fully agree with her that China's development of anti-satellite weapons has to be one of our most pressing 
national security concerns. Uh, when I was in government, that was my real priority. And indeed, in 2016, we held two rounds of the US-China space security talks. Now, I think this administration has, I think, done a lot of good things in the space security areas. Uh, for example, reestablishing US Space Command. However, they have a gaping hole when it comes to diplomacy, in particular, diplomacy in the space area with China. Um, based on publicly available information, it does not appear that this administration has decided to re-engage the space security talks with China or similar talks. They need to do that. Now, to your broader question, and that is uh, this kind of stakeholders versus participants. Uh, I had the opportunity to testify before the House Foreign Affairs Committee last summer on Russian and Chinese nuclear policy and doctrine. And one of the first lines in my testimony was this. You can no longer look at strategic stability or risk reduction through a bilateral one-weapon model. Emerging actors and new technologies are dramatically reshaping geopolitical calculations in this area. Therefore, you need to develop a framework to have that discussion. First and foremost, we need to have a framework to engage our allies. I disagree with this administration on many, many things, but I do believe they are correct that we are in an era of great power competition. And I would argue one of the asymmetric advantages of the United States is our system of alliance and partnerships. And we need to bring them closer. And as we think about next steps in arms control, we have to do it in a way that is closely connected with our allies. Um, secondly, we need to find a, by a multilateral dialogue that brings the key nuclear stakeholders to the table. And there are a couple of ways to do this. Um, one idea, and I put this on the table a little earlier, is having trilateral strategic stability talks between the US, Russia, and China. Because at the end of the day, that's really the crux of the challenge moving forward. Um, another option, I think Alex talked about this, was the P5 process. Now, the P5 process was initiated uh, early in the Obama administration. It primarily focused initially on arms control and non-proliferation issues in the run-up to the NPT review conferences. But towards the end of the Obama administration, we began a discussion on strategic stability. For example, in October of 2016, I chaired the first P5 discussion on nuclear policy and doctrine. And I had low expectations going into this dialogue. But to be honest with you, it turned out to be a very useful uh, and productive dialogue. My hope is that the administration will continue these types of dialogues. And, and then finally, at some point, we will need to bring India and Pakistan into that discussion. And there is precedent for that. Uh, during the Obama administration, we held a P5 plus process to talk about a potential fissile material cutoff treaty. That could be a nice model for bringing India and Pakistan into this discussion at the appropriate time. Thank you. So Alex, you yeah. to jump in on that? Yeah, we'll so just up. quick thought. Uh, you know, we've created the means for our own destruction. That means whether or not you're paying attention, every single person on this planet is a stakeholder. And uh, the more the public engages, that you know, the, <laughs> the American public in our own context pays for nuclear weapons. They pay for the entire US arsenal. They should be participating in the conversation about how we're using it, 
how we're rebuilding it, how we're engaging in dialogues. Um, I know that's you know a, a hard thing to do with all of the various things that that uh, are in the public mind right now, uh, but everyone is a stakeholder. I think the U.S. has already made good efforts through things like the IPNDV, um, and uh, you know, it, as much as the creating the environment for nuclear disarmament discussion is still, still pretty nascent, um, uh, Assistant Secretary Ford is not wrong. There are security conditions that make further arms control and non-proliferation agreements hard, and we need to be engaging in that conversation. We need to make it as broad as possible. Um, you know, coming from really high numbers to low numbers was the easy part. Everything from here on out, uh, because of having to do it in a multilateral fashion, because of these new technologies, is just going to get harder. So we need people to be patient but persistent and understand that if we really want to reduce nuclear risk, everybody is going to have to work having to work with each other and uh, spending a little less time complaining about what everyone's doing wrong. Thank you. Vince, any thoughts? I, so I, I mean, I agree, nuclear weapons affect everyone. That's why uh, it's still critically important that the states that actually have nuclear weapons need a, a coherent and effective strategy for risk reduction. For the United States, that's always included a, a combination of deterrence, arms control, and diplomacy. So you, you need to have a vision, and you need to be very good at going out and explaining that division, uh, vision and persuading others why they should cooperate with you. So, I mean, in my sense, I think uh, given the, the range of obstacles for sort of the future of nuclear arms control that we've discussed today, it, it seems like the most prudent path forward is you extend the New Star Treaty, right? I think that's something that I, I know there's some, some issues that the, the Russians have raised. I, fundamentally, I think there's a good chance if there's leadership at the leadership and, and the decision to do so at the, at the uh, top levels of, of the U.S. Russian governments, uh, that's going to happen and you could do it, right? And then take stock and think through what comes next. And if you extend the New START Treaty, you give yourself more time to think through some of these uh, issues associated with non-strategic nuclear weapons, missile defenses, conventional strike, multiple actors. You know, I, I personally think that we could have a, another treaty and, and China does not need to be a signatory yet. In, in my sense, the the next step with, with China is really trying to get to what I would describe as arms control without a treaty, and that's uh, a dialogue and a, and a predictability regime that's less about, it's not about limiting numbers, it's more about talking about the weapons, explaining the forces you have and why you have them. Uh, so I think there's, there's room for progress there, but uh, fundamentally the United States needs to have a vision and, and needs to kind of move out on persuading the world of why it's the right vision. Thank you. Okay, so we can open up. Uh, if any of the uh, others want to kind of chime in, um, but uh, are there some questions or responses out here? Please. And please do introduce yourself and uh, tell us who you are and where you're from. Yeah. Thank you. Veronica Cartier. I'm a local um, think tank community. My question is, is for Sea Power. In recent years, China and Russia relationship have been closer than ever. And they have developed the high technology underwater weapons, such as nuclear submarine and unmanned um, torpedo deployment. And in fact that we have seen more and more incident on a coastline in Asia and Indo-Pacific region, such as tsunami. And now, as we have our naval scientists here, is there anything that international community should know the future threat uh, from China and Russia for under uh, water attacks? And what should we do about that? And I think that we have to be to to more publicize about this threat. Thank you very much. I might take more than one if there's uh, more than one question, or if there's one that's related. Rachel. So something that Vince and Alex kind of touched on, but want to go a little deeper. Uh, to flip the topic of the panel on its head. I'm Rachel Webb, sorry, <laughs> SIC. To flip the topic of the panel on its head, uh, do you see any forced posture decisions we're making today impacting the potential for arms control? Any other 
finish them already, but I've got one down here. Hello, my name is Grace Lotvi. Thank you for speaking today. What consequences do you foresee in general proliferation of missile defense capabilities around the world? If you foresee challenges, how do you recommend overcoming them? Specific metrics, metrics. Right, but that three actually spreads out you know, pretty well across you. So, um, Oriane, do you mind sort of tackling question one there? Sure. Um, so I'm not as concerned about the competition underwater right now. I mean, this is one area where the United States still really enjoys dominance is in submarine warfare. Uh, now, of course, China is more and more focusing on its, its own capabilities and anti-submarine warfare in particular, but that's always been kind of a traditional area of weakness for the Chinese compared to what I'm more focused on, which is surface combatants. So China is you know, building, um, engaging in a very large shipbuilding effort such that they will have the capability relatively soon especially if they fully militarize from the islands in the South China Sea to control all of those waters and if they chose to, to deny um, others uh, access to those waters. So I'm much more concerned, I guess, about what's happening on the surface of the water and what's happening in the air than, than what's happening underwater at this time. And just a quick point on the, um, you know, is there anything we're doing now that makes arms control more difficult? I would just say that in general, the more the United States has the vulnerabilities and we have certain Achilles heels, China is going to exploit those. And so if I had to, if my goal was to make arms control more likely, I would say it's more likely um, if uh, the United States has less vulnerability such that Chinese weapons don't have such an impact. So you can think more about dispersal options or protection options or defense options. Then maybe China thinks, well, having this ASAT you know, isn't my what they, you know, an assassin's miss, isn't the sort of game changer. Having co-orbital um, ASATs is not a game changer. Having these cruise missiles is not a game changer, so maybe I'm willing to, to trade them uh, in return for something else. So I really think we would have to make decisions that make their current um, development of certain platforms less effective at really crippling us, then they might be more likely to uh, negotiate over them. Uh, so, so, yeah, I'll just one point on, on so obviously we heard Senator uh, Fisher this morning talk about the, the novel Russian delivery vehicles, and, and those are clearly could create some real complications for new start extension or, or negotiating some kind of a follow on agreement, which again I think is, is a challenging but not impossible. And so I wanted to just touch on those uh, real quickly. So, Senator Fisher, I think, specifically mentioned the the Russian concept for a, tor a torpedo and a nuclear-powered cruise missile. So neither of those would, would count against the, the New START definitions of, of a strategic delivery vehicle. But it's important to, to keep this in context. So first, if, if they did come online during the life of the treaty, there's a mechanism to raise them as, uh, capture them as, as new kinds of strategic offensive arms, right? If they're gonna, and, and to me it's not at all clear that the, these things are gonna come online before 2026. Uh, so you could conceivably in, in the negotiations for a follow-on treaty when you think they're going to come into force include the definition so that they would be captured. But just to play out the kind of the worst case scenario, and, and to be clear, I definitely think that these things should be captured under an arms control agreement. But to play out the worst case scenario where you have an arms control agreement and Russia deploys these systems and they're not constrained by the treaty, from my perspective, as far as we can tell, uh, th these are niche capabilities. Russia's probably investing in them in large part because they want a non-ballistic option because they're so concerned about U.S. missile defenses. And, and they're not going to account for a large portion of Russia's strategic, uh, strategic delivery vehicles. Like, I, I, I would be surprised if they even counted for more than, than 1%. So ultimately, if I have a policy choice between uh, a, a treaty that covers 99% of Russia's strategic delivery vehicles uh, and provides transparency into them or a, uh, a choice between, or a choice of not having anything covered because I really want to cover these systems so badly. I think, to me, I, I would prefer to have 99% of Russia's strategic force covered. But again, it's, these, these are, uh, are going to be complicated issues that are, are going to require further study and, and debate. Yeah, let me just build on um, Vince's point. I think when you look at the hypergonic, uh, hypersonic glide vehicle and the autonomous torpedo, they are fundamentally about ensuring Russia has a secure second strike capability 
against the United States. They're not necessarily first strike weapons per se. Uh, with regard to your question about the proliferation of missile defense technologies, uh, as this crowd is well aware, uh, Russia has a ballistic missile defense system around Moscow. They are also developing theater missile defense systems like the S-400 and S-500. Uh, China is developing, they say, a strategic missile defense system and are also developing effective um, theater, air, and missile defense systems. I am not all that concerned about those capabilities uh, as long as the United States moves forward with its strategic modernization program, especially penetrating capabilities like the B-21 and the long-range standoff nuclear cruise missile. Yeah. I Sort of think about that whole Putin video, uh, like a Steve Jobs with nuclear weapons. He was, he was clearly just showing off a lot of the things that uh, they're conceptualizing for a domestic audience. Um, you know, but essentially, he was saying we could already kill you. Now we can kill you extra good. Uh, you know, they they are capable of uh, posing an existential threat to the United States. They're still capable, no matter if they have those systems or not. Uh, but you know, why are they pursuing these systems? Ostensibly for things like dealing with U.S. missile defenses. So therein goes to your question. We have to start having conversations about how missile, our missile defense posture affects uh, strategic stability. And, and any weapon system, any defensive system that we have should be viewed through a cost-benefit lens. And if we're losing more by deploying systems that are technically not necessarily even the best possible systems, then we need to weigh whether or not it's worth pursuing those, at, at least as far as long range systems are concerned. All right, thank you. We're getting close to the end. Might be time for one more if there's a burning desire. Does someone have one? This is a very calm group today. Um, so, uh, First of all, let me just uh, thank you all for tremendous comments, for a great day of discussion. I think there's a lot to take away, but also I always feel like you know, kind of just start to really dig away at the surface and get to uh, get to sort of the, the really meaty stuff, and then we have to stop. So I'm hoping that we don't really have to stop, and that in fact this is the beginning of a lot of deeper analysis about what arms control could really look like. Um, I know you all uh, from from where we started at one o'clock in both of the panels, you know, I know I'm thinking a lot like, can we be more creative about participation and the role of stakeholders and participants and think about roles in these agreements that are not just simple binary choices between, is this a bilateral agreement or a multilateral agreement? I feel like there must be some nuance in there that gets the voices in play in different ways. I'm really interested in thinking about, is there a way to engage China in a way that isn't just China gets to kind of kibitz on everybody else. Yeah. That doesn't feel terribly constructive. But maybe there's some ways to kind of use that to open other doors. Um, scope, you know, we're the project on nuclear issues and it's really clear when it comes to the future of arms control, it just isn't all nuclear. And we're just gonna have to find a way to get over that. Like it just isn't. But that also doesn't mean it's all gonna be in one big pile all together and it's gonna be like the world's biggest treaty with, you know, everybody in the world and every weapon in the world, because you're right, it's just completely unmanageable. Yeah. So how are we going to do that? Which I think takes us back to some ideas that came up in the earlier panel. You know, whether you think of it as the patchwork, uh, whether you think of it as the islands, uh, whatever dynamic it is, there is a sense of there might be some bottom-up opportunities, some test beds, some smaller things, that it is in their amalgamation that we might start to see some breakthroughs, you know, as opposed to exclusively looking at you know, these kind of large, top-down, traditional treaties. What are different ways to put pieces together in such a way that we achieve some of those fundamental objectives? Um, you know, whether those objectives include disarmament or not, I think is, can almost in some ways be put aside because I think there's a lot of universal interest in those three core principles. How do we reduce the risk of, of nuclear or strategic conflict? Should we be unable to completely avoid that risk? How do we make it less dangerous, less catastrophic? 
and how do we reduce the costs of preparing ourselves and, and engaging in deterrence in such a ways that we don't lead to arms racing. It's really hard to imagine a world, whether it's on Capitol Hill or looking at you know, consensus where people can't stand together and say, that's something to build on. Um, so I hope that's a perspective we can bring going forward. So um, I don't want to keep you too much from the reception that we have from you outside, but I am going to take one moment just for thank yous. Uh, thank you to the participants who put together their remarks, both of our panels, very much to Senator Fisher for in her, the schedule was crazy and she really got here even though she was under a lot of pressure. We're very grateful for that. Um, so you all did a wonderful job. Thank you to the Pony team for pulling everything together, to Sarah for really carrying the bulk of the, the work on this. I, I barely did a thing, and she really engaged with all of you and did all the work uh, with great support from the rest of the, the Pony team there, so thank you. And I would be remiss not thanking Northrop Grumman for making the resources possible so that we could have you all here today for this important conversation. So you'll have a chance to visit, um, but for now, please join me in thanking the panelists and those who've come before. All right.